that little tug, a stirring that says you are designed for more. The goal you've always wanted to accomplish or a sense of purpose you've always wanted to feel. The dream of combining your passion with your vocation. At Regent, you'll be challenged to excel both in mind and spirit. To reach for personal excellence and change lives for the better. That little tug, it's not for someone else. It's for you. My name is Michelle Bachman, Dean of the Robertson School of Government here at Regent University. I want to thank you so much for joining us today for what I believe you'll find is remarkable information. All over the world, people are asking the same question, what has happened to America? It's almost an understatement to say that our country has dramatically changed. And people are asking, Will we ever go back to the way we were 18 months ago when gasoline was $1.89 a gallon? But changes are happening even beyond America. It's not just in this nation. In the Western nations, suddenly and simultaneously, we're seeing globalism and authoritarianism rising. This is unprecedented in modern times, and it has left America without, in some cases, our constitutionally guaranteed rights of freedom of speech, freedom of worship, assembly, and the right to petition our government for our grievances, and the right to determine what goes into our bodies. Today, we'll do a deep dive with the help of our expert presenters to answer these questions and more. But first, we'll see documented evidence of the rise of authoritarianism globally. After that, we'll examine the World Economic Forum and its stated goals for global governance. Then, United States Senator Rand Paul will join us live from Washington, D.C. to speak on medical authoritarianism. Then Dr. Ed Heinsen of Liberty University will present a biblical examination of the times we live in. And in closing, we'll look at the history of authoritarian movements and how our modern experience might fare by comparison. Though these days are perplexing, and in some cases troublesome, I wanna urge you to carefully listen to our conference in its entirety, because the good news, the best news, the encouraging news will be forthcoming. Yes, there is hope, because there is always hope. And by the time we finish, you'll want to forward our conference link to other people. In fact, I'm encouraging you, please do so right now. I urge you to please send a text or an email, maybe go on Facebook, Twitter, or some other social media that you follow to invite your friends and your followers to tune in now to this conference. You'll be glad that you did. Afterwards, I think you'll say, I wish I would have invited other people to watch. So invite them now. And thank you for joining our conference today. It is my honor to welcome our first speakers of the day. They are twin brothers who happen to also be twin editors of one of the finest and hear this, most accurate news sites on the internet today. Their names are Jim and Joe Hoft. They founded the gatewaypundit.com news site and will share specific examples from across the world of the unprecedented rise of global governance. Please join me in welcoming Jim and Joe Hoft of the gatewaypundit.com.
Thank you, Dean Bachman. We're thrilled to be here today. Um, this has really uh, been an exciting time for us to go back and look through all of these articles that we put up on Gateway Pundit. We went through 28,365 articles and we isolated about 200 articles and that's what we put together in our presentation that we're going to share with you today. Um, for those of you who don't know, uh, I'm Jim Hoff and this is Joe Hoff, my twin brother. And uh, I founded the Gateway Pundit in 2004 and today it's uh, ranked number 163 in the country of all websites. In, in size, so that's through Alexa rankings. You can, you can look that up, um, which is really a miracle and a blessing because uh, we are one of the conservative outlets that gets probably the most censored, the most smeared, um, the most deleted and abused uh, out there. So really, but thank you God for, for giving us uh, you know, the success we've had. But you know what we've done is we continue to report what we believe is the truth, we correct our articles if there is any mistakes, but we put out the truth because we know today that we're just getting gaslit as a population. Every morning you get up, you're gonna get uh, fake news thrown in your face from the minute you get up to the minute you go to bed. We try to correct that, and that's why we're such a number one target. And it's also the reason why today we have 2.5 million readers a day at the Gateway Pundit. Our numbers continue to grow despite the censorship. So we're really excited to go start going through this, uh, this chronicles of our articles from the past two years on authoritarianism in this country. It's really unbelievable. We think we have a great presentation. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Jim, and thanks, Dean Bachman. We're, we're thrilled to be here. We're going to start off our presentation by stepping back and looking at where we were at in early January of 2020. And so our first slide here really just kind of covers that. The economy was booming. The Trump economy was on fire. All reports were that Trump's going to roll into the next election with a landslide based on just the economy alone. We saw unemployment at 3.5%. President Trump in mid-January signed a historic agreement with China at that time, another trade agreement that was for the betterment of the United States. And, uh, and he was very popular, even in a blue state of New Jersey, in late, in the, in late in the month of January, he had more than 100,000 people sign up for one of his rallies. So the momentum was on President Trump's side. He had still a number of headwinds that were facing him. Yeah, he was in the middle of a, an impeachment at the time, the first bogus impeachment. Um, so in January of 2020 is when we first started hearing about uh, this coronavirus, this mysterious illness that was uh, taking place. We heard about it in China. Um, the WHO first said there's no clear evidence that human-to-human -human transmission of this disease. So that was one of their first big mistakes, okay? Um, that was on January 14th. On January 21, um, we're going to play the video after I'm through with this, uh, with this segment. But uh, Dr. Fauci, that's when uh, he said that uh, it was not a major threat for the people of the United States, this, this virus that they were seeing in China. On January 22nd, China announces the coronavirus outbreak officially. Uh, they blamed it on bats right away. So people were looking up bat soup and all these things and showing this wet market and showing people eating bats in restaurants. Um, that was because China said they came from uh, naturally from bats. And then in, on January 23rd, the WHO downplayed the coronavirus risk uh, at first and urged open borders. That was back on January 23rd, so another mistake by the WHO. Um, now we have a video of Dr. Fauci from the 21st. Manageable numbers. Um, bottom line, we don't have to worry about this one, right? Well, I, you know, obviously you need to take it seriously and do the kinds of things that the CDC and the Department of Homeland Security are doing, but this is not a major threat for the people in the United States, and this is not something that the citizens of the United States right now should be worried about. So at this time, my twin brother, Joe, was a big business executive in Hong Kong. He had been there for 10 years. He ran audit teams throughout East Asia. Um, he was delivering presentations to uh, boards of directors. Um, and uh, he, his wife is from China, and they actually were in Hubei province, which if uh, some of you may know, that's where Wuhan is. And that's where Joe was right about the time that the outbreak uh, first, for when we first started hearing about it. So I'm, Joe's gonna tell about his experience. Mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah, briefly, that's a picture of Wuhan, by the way, on a clear day. So there's maybe one day out of the year that you'll see a clear day in Wuhan. I, I can attest to that. The pollution there is just unreal. 
And um, so my wife's family's from Hubei province outside of Wuhan, about 100 miles. As Jim mentioned, I was a corporate executive in Hong Kong. I'd been there about 10 years and uh, had traveled the world, et cetera, and throughout Asia Pacific at that time. We were up at her family's on January 2nd of, Jan of uh, 2020 uh, visiting. For the past, for the prior six months or so in Hong Kong, we had an executive team that was meeting almost daily due to the riots in Hong Kong at that time. And so, and, and, and our purpose was really to protect our employees, et cetera. And right about this time is when I got the first message saying, hey, there's something going on in China. Maybe we should bring this up in our next meeting when we get together after the holiday. And what it was was this incident happening in, in Wuhan. And so we made it back from the middle of Hubei to Shenzhen, which is a massive city just on the other side of the border from Hong Kong. And, and the airport was empty. And then we made it into Hong Kong. About a week later, my young, we have a six-year-old, he got sick with a real high temperature. And already our decisions were being impacted by this coronavirus because we didn't want to take him to the hospital because if you do, he, they'd put him in quarantine for 10 days. So the choice as a parent was either keep your son at home or take him to the hospital and let him sit alone, a five-year-old in a hospital for 10 days. We opted to keep him home. And those are the kind of decisions, and, and he was fine the next day, thank God. But those are the kind of decisions that, that we all had to go through during this whole past couple years. And, and then a week later, the Chinese New Year happened. And for the first time ever that I'm aware of, China basically canceled the Chinese New Year due to this coronavirus. And from that point forward in Hong Kong, everybody was masking up and we were working from home immediately early January of, or late January of 2020. Um, what we started to see about this time then was uh, uh, videos that were reportedly from Wuhan. And so immediately we saw these very frightening videos that they were putting out of people just dropping on the, uh, in the street. Okay, and so of course when you see these, these things happening, it's, it's creating the panic uh, around the world. The, 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 the global panic is building. So we, we uh, included one here, one of these videos of uh, just people dropping uh, in Wuhan. Of course, they made that, uh, uh, made you think that this is something that happened, uh, you know, in the middle of the street that people were dropping from this disease. So people were uh, getting panicked. Um, another thing, here's an, an image that came out. Uh, they uh, had a, a crackdown in uh, Wuhan and they built a, a barricade. So, so this, uh, they built a, a brick wall in the middle of the street so people can't get out. So uh, again, uh, creating this, this, this terror in your minds, uh, this is what's building, this is what's happening in, in China. We're starting to see these pictures in the West. Um, and then at the same time, we don't have the video of this, but uh, uh, there's a leaked video of a, a Chinese man saying that one million people may die from COVID. So we're, we're, you know, it's, it's building up. People are very, uh, they're building a lot of panic around the world for this uh, coronavirus. So by late January, President Trump has been obviously discussing the situation in China for some time. And uh, he made the decision at that point in time to cancel all flights uh, from Hubei province into the United States. And uh, he, was, uh, he, was, he was called names for that, et cetera. But uh, it tur turned out it was, I guess, the right thing to do. Um, and then, is this mine? Um, well, yeah. we're starting to see, too, this is just at the same time. Um, so it wasn't just a coronavirus that we're starting to see these um, dictatorial uh, uh, announcements in, di in, in different countries. Uh, Trudeau, is, is, is uh, one of his ministers, was suggesting that all websites must get government license uh, in order to uh, uh, share their message online. Uh, there's run on toilet papers. Uh, that started in uh, the United States, but it had already gone on in, um, in, in Hong Kong at the time. I remember I was sending my brother in Hong Kong face masks and uh, hand sanitizer. So there was already this, this panic on that. Twitter um, censored Gateway Pundit for the first time or, uh, around that time, um, right before the 2020 election. 
Um, uh, Trump then was acquitted on February 5th. This is just some peripheral, in, you know, things that are happening. Uh, so he was uh, acquitted from this first sham impeachment, and uh, Reddit pur purged their moderators. And this is um, this is interesting because this is what they do in Hong Kong at the time. Um, Reddit purged the moderators, and they said, "But well, you can select from these other moderators on the Donald Channel, uh, which which people you want." So that, so it's it's similar to what was going on in Hong Kong where politicians had to be approved from the Chinese Communist Party um, in Beijing in order to run for election in Hong Kong. So, uh -huh. so some of these things were happening at the time. Yeah, definitely. And this is uh, where Biden, uh, in February 1st, Biden called Trump a xenophobic for, for implementing his Wuhan, uh, uh, what was it, censorship for any flights coming into the U.S. Pelosi at the time, though, she's pushing uh, China people to go to Chinatown and, and enjoy the Chinese New Year and the holidays, and uh, also on February 9th in New York, uh, uh, one of the top individuals there is also encouraging people go to Chinatown. Don't st you know? Don't stay away from Chinatown. Go to Chinatown. Remember, this is right after the impeachment. This is after China's been pushing this uh, horrible, frightening uh, coronavirus to the world. All right. So um, then, immediately, this was was interesting. On February 19th in 2020. The Lancet, which is this, uh, you know, uh, maybe the most uh, noted uh, medical journal in the in the world, uh, very re well respected. They put out this uh, this letter from Dr. Peter Datsik, um, and they were refuting these what they were calling conspiracies that this coronavirus was uh, from a lab, that it was an artificial um, virus created in a lab. So already they were starting to uh, uh, counter what they called the conspiracies and propaganda. Now, as we found out later, for this study with The Lancet um, that was published in The Lancet, Dr. Fauci had contacted Dr. Datsik. He's the one that initiated this, and several of their uh, close allies were the ones who, who wrote this initial, um, this initial report in The Lancet. Um, and then uh, we, we, it took a year and a half later where some other doctors then came out and said, wait a minute, um, uh, they refuted it completely, um, and uh, uh, they eviscerated uh, Fauci and, and Datsik uh, for, for putting out this initial report because there was, it wasn't based in fact. They, these doctors were already afraid what people may find out at the time in February of 2020. Right. There's a couple of reasons for that, too. One is they might be feared, fear that they are being implicated in this due to their, well, how they were involved in, in developing this type of research and development surrounding, or surrounding uh, uh, the coronavirus. But also China had a, had a uh, position on this, too. They had just signed that trade agreement. And if this co uh, coronavirus was natural, then that could in actually aid them in getting out of that trade ag agreement. If it was found that it was something that was created, then it was a whole different story. Um, <clears throat> so the early data that came in in March, there was no cases of coronavirus found in children. This was a study, uh, the first numbers that came out of Italy. As we recall, Italy was one of the first countries that got really hit by this virus. And uh, so some of these early numbers, as we're going back through this uh, recently, Joe and I going through this in our, in our writers, from Gateway Pundit, going through all this information. Some of the early information that we saw that was true then never changed. Throughout this two, and a, two years, this information has been consistent. Uh, the first initial numbers from Italy, no children died from this virus, none. Okay, now, gradually, as more and more people get infected, there were some children that died. But initially, no children were affected. Um, the, there was... Uh, uh, some doctors that came out in early March saying uh, the COVID, maybe the mortality rate might be closer to the flu than something much worse. Because the WHO at that time, the World Health Organization, was saying that this, this had a 3.4% mortality rate. Of course, they're creating panic in the whole world because they're saying 3.4% rather than something like a flu, which is, you know, under 1%. So a huge difference. Um, we're also uh, seeing that 83% of those uh, people affected... Um, the mortality rate, uh, let's see, uh, of the infected persons was less than 1%. So, uh, 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 and we're seeing the average age, this was important, the average age in Italy was people were 81 years old who were dying. So these are, you know, 
extremely old, old you know, uh, and, and a lot of people with comorbidities. Um, so uh, uh, it, it, the Italian health ministry said that th only 3% of uh, the victims and the fatalities were people who did not have comorbidities. So we were seeing that early on, it never changed, uh -huh. never changed. Yeah, so we're gonna play this video next. This is uh, the head of the WHO, Dr. Tedros, and he claimed very early on there in March that, the, that COVID was gonna have 3.4% mortality. So I'm gonna play that, then I'll make a couple comments. Some people are susceptible to infection and some will suffer severe disease. Globally, about 3.4% of reported COVID-19 cases have died. By comparison, seasonal flu generally kills far fewer than 1% of those infected. So the shocking, there, these numbers were shocking. We started looking at them because we're like, no way is this thing 3.4%. I mean, I, I guess the thing that Jim has is experience looking at our media and realizing that they're not telling us the truth. And I, and I had a financial background, as, as Jim's mentioned. So we started looking at these numbers, and really within about 15 minutes, you could see what was going on here. He says there that 3.4% of the people that, that had been reported with COVID were actually dying. But then he says with the flu, it's 0.7%, almost insinuating by the same measurement the flu so, so much less. But what he doesn't share there, what we found out you know, at that time, was with the flu, we don't know all the people that, that catch the flu. So in our estimates from the CDC, they will add in an estimated number of people that caught the flu that we don't know about, that never go to the hospital, some that barely even had any, anything, you know, maybe a, what, a stuffy nose or something, et cetera. Those people don't get counted, so the CDC adds up and grosses up their numbers, both for deaths as well as for people that have it, by the millions. And they weren't doing that with COVID. So it was two different measurements, really. It was looking at apples and oranges, and yet he threw them together to make it sound like, wow, this thing's going to have a 3.4% comorbidity or, or mortality rate, and it was, he wasn't even close. We wrote about that at the time and got thoroughly attacked by the media because we were saying, no, that isn't right. <clears throat> um, the global panic starts in uh, March. It's, it's, it's in high gear. Uh, the trading halted in the markets in the U.S. Uh, after a 7% drop. Uh, Italy quarantined the entire country, which was just terrifying for everybody to watch this happen. And then Trump, uh, in March, then uh, banned flights from, from uh, Italy and Europe for uh, 30 days. So Trump was taking action at the time and getting ridiculed and attacked from the left for doing these things. Um, this is, this is uh, some background we found on the early lockdowns. So we all recall the big quote, 15 days to slow the spread. We're just gonna shut down the economy for 15 days, everybody stay home, it'll be great. Everybody, you know, we'll move on after that. It's gonna be great. Well, we look back and uh, we reported at Gateway Pundit at the time on March 13th, um, Fauci was warning about a complete U.S. shutdown is on the table. It's on the table. And then uh, Fauci was urging President Trump to lock down the U.S. economy uh, for two weeks. So this was uh, March 13th. On March 14th and 15th, uh, Dr. Fauci and then Dr. Birx um, went into the Oval Office. And Dr. Birx was on the coronavirus team. She was the uh, response coordinator on the coronavirus team. They went into the White House Oval Office and they sat down with Trump uh, between the 14th and 15th. Trump admitted this later in, in one of his, his talks. He said two very smart people came into the Oval Office and they told me that we're going to have 2.2 million people die. And um, so that was Fauci and Burks. They went into his office. They said 2.2 million people are die. Uh, of course, that's a huge number unless you lock down. You need to lock down. So Trump took their advice and we went into the lockdown. Now, what is not being told and what the media has refused to look at is that this 2.2 million figure came from uh, an organization in the United Kingdom. It was uh, Neil Ferguson and his group, and they, uh, they were the ones who put together these uh, huge numbers of people that they were predicting were gonna die. Um, and yet, some people looked at his numbers just shortly afterwards, and they're like, we can't replicate this. We don't know what he's basing this on. And he was completely inaccurate. He went back and changed all his numbers in a couple months later. But uh, this is what uh, 
the, the experts in the U.S., this is what they were using to uh, tell the president, you need to shut down. So it was complete, the people were acting uh, based on panic. They weren't acting based on logic. They weren't looking at the facts. Uh, and, and, and President Trump was getting bad numbers from his so-called experts. Mm -hmm. So that's when we had the, the 15 days to slow the spread that ended up to be, what, two years and, and counting. So in China, about the same time, notice this, they, they suddenly say, hey, we're pretty much done with this thing. We're going back to work. Everything's fine. Now, if you remember earlier, but a couple weeks, month earlier, they were showing these pictures of people being bricked in and into their communities and not being able to leave. So now they're saying, well, that apparently worked. They're sending this message to the, to the world community on the 14th, two days before this uh, uh, Trump's uh, 15 days to stop the spread. Two days before they're showing here in China, in Wuhan, actually, they're all going back to work. So it must work. And they're all celebrating. <clears throat> so this is from Wuhan. Everybody's celebrating. The masks are off. They, they beat the coronavirus. They lock down. Everybody's safe. OK, so this is, this is what we were getting from China at the time. Um, and you can draw your own conclusions to that. You know what's interesting is I looked up some numbers today. Um, China today still, uh, with their coronavirus numbers, they, they say today that uh, uh, they only had 145,000 cases in, in China, a country of 1.2 billion, 1.3 billion, uh, only 145,000 cases total. And they only have had 4,638 deaths. So this is, this is the information we got from China, okay? We just broke on the uh, uh, worldometer, we just broke the United States, broke over 1 million deaths. In the in the past uh, in this past week, it went over one million. So completely different numbers, but that's what China was giving us at the time. Um, also, uh, the big tech censorship now. So what we're seeing then is something uh, maybe that wasn't as noticeable in the past, but uh, big tech, uh, big pharma, big government—they're all working together now against the people. And so Twitter announces that there's going to have new rules to crack down on coronavirus misinformation and jokes, right? And jokes, okay, and memes. Um, the CDC asked the tech giants um, uh, to crack down on, uh, on uh, uh, the, 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 their platforms, and they say that they're going to start tracking Americans who are not practicing uh, proper social distancing. So they're asking help from the tech giants to make sure that we're, you know, we're, we're uh, apart from each other uh, you know, for, far enough. And then the YouTube CEO at the time, uh, this was interesting. Uh, she goes that uh, we, we, we put this video on Gateway Pundit, but uh, she was saying that anything that goes against the uh, World Health Organization recommendations is going to be a violation of policy from now on. So if you spoke out against the WHO, then they're going to take down your, uh, your, your posts, your videos, um, your, your opinions, um, and that's what they did. Um, the first uh, HCQ study, listen to this. Hydroxychloroquine back on March 16th of 2020, they already knew, there was already some studies that were done that showed that, hey, this could be successful in treating this disease, and especially with early treatment. And it also made a good prophylactis. So that's what the first reports we saw that were coming out um, talking about hydroxychloroquine. Um, and then Trump announced on the 19th then that uh, they were gonna use this hydroxychloroquine and they're gonna to try to make it available because they were hearing some success stories. Um, I, I put this, this post up because Dr. Oz was one of these people who was uh, acting uh, reason, reasonable. He was acting logical. He was looking at facts. He wasn't one of the media people who was just running with the panic. And he actually started a testing um, he was going to run his own tests on this hydroxychloroquine, and he was speaking out about that and how he had some great hopes that this, this could be a game changer. Um, unfortunately, um, New York State shut down his study at the time, so he wasn't able to complete that. We had um, Dr. Fauci go out on, uh, he went out uh, while Trump was speaking during a White House press conference and said, oh, I don't know if we, this, is, this isn't going to be that good, this hydroxychloroquine. We shouldn't, you know, it's, 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 um, it's not, it's not going to be that effective. And Fauci said that um, once or twice, and it was enough for the media to go on a, a jihad against President Trump and, and anyone who promoted that uh, 
a very cheap drug, safe drug that had been around for since World War II. They had been using it. Um, and uh, there were even reports in the media about how uh, people were dying from uh, hydroxychloroquine, something that we had never heard of before. Okay, so they were just doing all they could to, uh, to, to, to make sure that people would not take this or not look at this as a possible treatment for uh, the coronavirus. So then along comes March 24th. Notice this is about a week after they started the uh, lockdown and, and really about three weeks since uh, Tedros had said, oh, this is gonna be 3.4% mortality. And at this point, and, and about a week or so after we said, no, that, those numbers aren't right, those numbers aren't right, Dr. Burks, uh, she at this point in, on, in, at the end of March confirmed basically what we'd said, that this mortality, oh, it's, it's a lot, that's a lot higher than it's really turning out to be because we were starting to get numbers then from other countries, so like South Korea, et cetera. And we could tell that those numbers weren't right. And there's Dr. Burks. Mm -hmm. but, they kept, but they kept moving forward with the, uh, with the lockdowns. Um, that is interesting, too, because she's the one who ran into the whole Oval Office and told Trump we're going to lose 2.2 2 million people. Yeah. Then within a week or 10 days or whatever it was, two weeks, yeah. uh, she's saying, well, like, we overestimated that. So but, let's but just move yeah, on. But, but no adjustment for their policy. And then we had uh, Pelosi here. She was saying uh, uh, oh, so, at so, this time, yeah, she's trying to ram this. Uh, so, so Congress is jumping into action, and they're going to try to pass some, some uh, uh, legislation to help the American public because everybody, nobody's working. People are losing their jobs. People are losing their businesses, uh, especially small businesses. So uh, the Congress jumps into action, and here uh, we see that Nancy Pelosi at the time was trying to put ballot harvesting into the coronavirus stimulus bill. So, so she's thinking of elections. And then um, uh, she also, uh, there was a famous video of Nancy Pelosi. Uh, we just thought this was, uh, it got a lot of attention at the time. She had a $25,000 refrigerator. She's at home and she's showing off her $13 tubs of gourmet ice cream while the rest of the public is uh, suffering. So uh, I think this is a trend we've seen throughout the, the, the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, the elites have a different lifestyle but they continue to lecture the general public on how they're supposed to live. Um, and then at, uh, in April, then we started seeing these uh, new, new sort of rules coming out. Um, the CDC website says that uh, uh, even if somebody just, you know, you think they have the coronavirus, we're gonna, we're gonna, uh, they're gonna list uh, COVID as a cause of death, um, you know, even if it's just assumed that they had it when they died. So, what we saw then was that the, the death counts, of course, were, were going up, but this added people um, uh, who died uh, from COVID coronavirus. It would, would include people who died from the virus and people who died with the virus. And that was all getting thrown in one pool, something we had not seen before. Mm -hmm. So this is just something to, uh, to pad the numbers, I guess, to, to make it sound... Um, Cer certainly, uh, you'd get many more uh, people dying that way, and uh, we were seeing that happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it overstated the mort mortality rate significantly. And then we saw, we did a post in the, in the uh, summer of 2020 where, according to the CDC, only 6% of the people that died from, from COVID actually died from COVID. The rest were died with COVID. And we, we put that up and we were attacked severely for that as well. And it was on the CDC website. We took, the, we yeah. took it directly from the CDC yeah. website. Yeah. <laughs> so. so. This. Oh, and then uh, the, the crackdowns. So which, what we're starting to see then at the same time is um, the lockdowns are going on. The lockdowns are extended. Um, so here we start seeing, as you can recall, some guys paddle boarding um, off Malibu and uh, he's all by himself on a paddleboard and he gets arrested by the cops because you can't do that, which mm -hmm. makes, you know, no sense. It makes no sense. Um, we saw these horrible videos of families out on the playgrounds. Um, a Colorado man was handcuffed in front of his six-year-old girl for um, violating the social distancing order in a park when they're playing together. Another video uh, came uh, out of a woman who's handcuffed and arrested by police in Idaho for letting her kids play in a park. So we're starting to see this complete overreach we've never seen in our history. Um, shocking, shocking abuse of the public. Mm -hmm. Then by mid-April, we started looking at the, uh, these, uh, the virus itself and how, how was this thing created? And we came up with some literature, found some, a number of items um, that really pointed back to China and to the Wuhan Institute of uh, Technology. So there's a lot of belief today that either that institute or some other institutes within China 
is where this uh, COVID uh, was created. Then we found out that not only that, but the US, U.S. had been funding this facility for, for years, literally. Millions of dollars, has, uh, the U.S. Has, has basically, we've come up with some other research, the U.S. has basically helped develop China's bioweapon entire, entire piece of or their function for their, com for their country with, through research, development, U.S. grants, and even, even uh, teaching the Chinese how to do a lot of this here in the U.S. at uni U.S. universities. Yeah. Well, we also found out that at that, uh, at that time in 2015, I believe it was, Joe, that they were doing some uh, gain-of-function research here in America, in North Carolina. Uh, they, they actually had an accident. Someone was killed, so they banned that from the U.S., but what happened then was then we just put it over in a different country, and uh, Fauci was funding, Dr. Fauci uh, was funding, it, funding this program over there. Mm -hmm. So they moved their program over there. We, were, we also were one of the first people, I believe we were the first, to put up some of these photos from the Wuhan lab, from inside the lab, people in their spacesuits uh, working with viruses mm -hmm. and uh, mice. Yeah, and it's kind of funny now, it's back in the news as we talk about Ukraine, that there was bio labs in Ukraine. We don't know exactly what's going on there, but here it is again. Why are we, why are we doing this stuff overseas? That's probably the best question. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, yeah. Um, so then we get the media propaganda here. This was this poor little boy. Um, he died from the coronavirus. He was the youngest boy. Um, and uh, unfortunately, he died in uh, Belgium, uh, the United Kingdom, and Portugal. Right? Uh -huh. So he got around, um, but um, so it was completely made up. Uh, a lot of the stories we saw from the fake news was, you know, this is, this is a big one that stood out because they had the same little boy in several countries who supposedly died from uh, the coronavirus. And by the end of April, you could see the U.S. economy was a whole different story than what it was at the beginning of the year with uh, around 30 or so million people now filing for, for claims for jobless unemployment claims. So kind of a scary situation in the U.S. It really went down real quick. Um, we also started to see pushback then. This is May. So the, the lockdowns, the two weeks to stop the spread started in March. Here in May, some people starting to stand up. We saw several churches, pastors, Sue Oregon, uh, Governor Kate Brown over religious gatherings. We saw this all over the place. Here's a, a few we just put up. Uh, there was uh, stylists and barbers. There was a noted barber in Michigan who re refused to shut down and he was getting in trouble. There was a woman in Texas who uh, refused, uh, Shelly Luther, who uh, refused to shut down her salon. And um, this was in Texas at the time. So these people, some people are finally starting to push back against this overreach by the government. Um, in, on, Mar on May 22nd, Trump designated houses of worship essential um, and uh, that they must open up immediately. So that, was, uh, that took a couple months, but in May, Trump, Trump uh, got that done. Mm -hmm. And then... Yeah, on May 27th, George Floyd, di Floyd died. So that was uh, obviously very significant and uh, tragic. And uh, we saw immediately then uh, what was happening was the left was uh, they burned down the business district in Minneapolis, a beautiful city for people who've been there, um, like Dean Bachman. And, um, and uh, so this is just right off the, the first weekend of rioting there. 25 people were killed. The property damage for the year of 2020 then was uh, up to $2 billion, estimates of up to $2 billion worth of damage in Kenosha, in Minneapolis, and some of these sit other cities. There was over uh, 2,000 law enforcement officers who were injured. Horrible videos coming out all summer long of these cops. Uh, there was a, a one in uh, Chicago where they're standing next to a statue, I think protecting a statue, and they're just getting pelted with all these objects. Um, so the, the cops were getting just blasted. Um, uh, at the end of the year, the insurance industry came out and said it was the most expensive damage in U.S. history, the riots of 2020, okay? This didn't get any play from the mainstream fake news, but um, it's, it's, it was a tragic, tragic thing that happened. And Black Lives Matter was linked to 91% of the riots in the country. I'm not sure who were doing the other 9%, but um, they were linked to, to 91%. Uh, it was interesting in May, in May, Nashville mayor, he urged people online to, to join, uh, join him for a Black Lives Matter march and protest uh, in his city. 
And uh, that's when the leftist mob broke off and they torched the city hall, the historic uh, courthouse too. So, you know, we had some leaders uh, and we had everyone talking about how these were peaceful protests and we're watching with our own eyes. You know, a famous clip was CNN saying that another, you know, it's mostly peaceful tonight as there's buildings burning behind the, the uh, reporter. So this is the kind of nonsense the media was pushing at the time. Um, and what was interesting, the hypocrisy too. Uh, we're, so, we're seeing uh, uh, health leaders saying, um, well, it's important for them to go out. It's important for you to protest, right? So these protests were okay for people to attend to. Um, and um, a lot of the top medical experts were asked specifically if they would let their kids go to one of these Black Lives Matter protests. And uh, they all said yes, except Dr. Fauci, who kind of hedged on it. He wasn't quite sure yet. Um, so uh, there was no church, no work, uh, but you could attend sweaty protests. Um, so that's what was going on in our country at the time. Mm -hmm. And the tyranny really continued and it really maybe kicked into a second gear at this time as well. I'm not going to go through all of these, but you can see just some of the crazy things that, they, that some of these politicians did. Uh, again, in Nashville, uh, on August 10th, the, uh, a lawmaker there said that uh, people not wearing a mask should be tried for murder or attempted murder. Again, now, by this time, we already knew that the mortality rate on this was about similar to the flu. <laughs> and yet he's, he's, they're making statements like that. You can see the, uh, what the L.A mayor did as well, basically shutting off water and power to the homes of people that are having large parties. Things like that had, had already started to take place. And then we jump into the 2020 election in November. And uh, we've got a couple pictures here. The first one is, comes out of Georgia. And it was uh, from the night of the election after individuals were, were emptied the, the arena where they were counting ballots. A few individuals stuck around. One of these individuals grabbed uh, some suitcases out from underneath the table and wheeled them up, and they started ramming these ballots through the uh, through the tabulator. So you can the yeah. videos out there. So we we reported on that at Gateway Pundit, and um, we were able to identify the people who were working in that room. They kicked out all the observers, sent them home for the night, but then they're you know pulling out these. Uh, what we called suitcases, and the, the left gets very upset with us when we call them suitcases. Now, mm -hmm. they're, they're cases on rollers that you're dragging out from under a table. So we keep calling them suitcases because that's what they look like to us and to most people. Um, but they were very upset about that. We identified the people who were doing this. There was about five people in the room. Um, and what we also noticed, and this was Joe through one of his contacts, and that was that uh, uh, at least two of these people in the room counting the ballots, they were taking stacks of ballots ramming them through the machine, grabbing that same stack, ramming it through again, grabbing that same stack, ramming it through again, okay? So um, we have been reporting on instances like this for the past year and a half since the election, and yet we still hear the mainstream media saying there's no proof of election fraud, right? Well, we have the video right there. Uh, it's still posted on our website. Uh, the next picture over in the middle there, this was uh, the Detroit TCF Center, late at night on election night. Um, at the, the, the following day, on, on November 4th, my friend Patty calls me. She's in the TCF Center in Detroit. And she says, Jim, um, I, I heard that they, they uh, brought in a van last night uh, at 3.30 in the morning. And there was, a, there was a car and there was a van. And they were dumping off boxes of ballots in the middle of the night. And I'm like, oh my gosh. So we posted that and then uh, of course, the mainstream media, the Detroit Free Press, and uh, PolitiFact wrote an article about us saying this is not true. No, this was one man just dragging in his little uh, equipment. He was a reporter. That's all that was happening. So uh, we requested the, the video, the security camera video, from inside the TCF Center. It took us several months. It was after uh, the inauguration before they were able to hand it over to us. And what we found was um, we were absolutely correct. A van drove in at 3.30 or 4 in the morning, um, dop dropped off 61 boxes of ballots in the TCF Center in Detroit. Uh, there was a, a, a car that was escorting it inside. The van left the building. Um, the van came back 45 minutes later, dropped off another 12 or 15 boxes of ballots. So this was happening in Detroit very shady. They were supposed to be turning in, in votes and ballots as they were 
um, inserted into these ballot drop boxes. Obviously, that didn't happen, and what we saw was this in the middle of the night, along with every battleground state at this mysterious time in the middle of the night where Donald Trump is way ahead in Pennsylvania, in uh, Wisconsin, in Michigan, in Georgia. Um, and all of a sudden, there's these big drops of ballots for Joe Biden, just out of nowhere. They still have never been explained, but uh, this, this was happening in our uh, elections in the United States. Tragic. Uh, the last picture there was uh, November 4th of 2020. That's this poor woman. She was working with my friend, Patty, um, in the TCF Center. And what happened was they told the GOP observers inside that counting room, hey, why don't you guys go take lunch? So all the GOP observers, they had to go outside for their lunch. Everybody else could stay inside for their lunch. They moved the GOP observers outside, they locked the doors, wouldn't let them back in, and then not only did they lock the doors, but they started putting pizza boxes up on the windows so that nobody could see inside to see what they're doing. And for the record, we, uh, we asked for this video from the TCF Center, and they sent us all this video that we had to go through, hours and hours of it, um, but they never showed us the counting room. They would not release that video to us, okay? They said, we don't have cameras in the big room. Well, uh, obviously that, that's not true, but uh, so this is some of the things we saw happening on election night yep. and, and the next few days. Yeah, and we could talk about that for, for days. I mean, every day there's new information coming out. So this, now we're jumping back to... I'm not sure where we got yeah, there. We kind of, yeah. the, the, the election jumped ahead there, but we're, Tom Fitton back in June 19th was saying, hey, uh, it looks like the radical left is going to use this COVID thing to insert basically mail-in voting in, into the election mm -hmm. process. So, so Tom Fenton was warning about back, that, and, back in and that's exactly what happened. Yeah, that's right. And, uh, and then we had uh, Bill Gates back in August of 2020, and he said some kind of what we think is kind of creepy things. We're going we're gonna to play this video next. Open up if things are done well over the next few months. But for the world at large, normalcy only returns when we've largely vaccinated the entire global population, and and there so. you go. Solution is to vaccinate, vaccinate the entire uh, population. Yeah. Here quickly is just a, a video and, that we put up, and there's pictures of Nancy Pelosi walking around a uh, a salon in San Francisco, getting her hair done without her mask on, where she's basically mandating that everybody wear masks at that time in San Francisco, and. Um, this leads up then to the uh, ins what they called the insurrection of January 6th. We call the insurrection on, uh, actually on November 3rd. But there's a lot here in this slide. By the way, all of our slides are going to be available at the Gateway Pundit, and I believe at, this, at, at your website as well after this, so you can look all of this up and, and double-check our timelines. And like Jim said, we've got all the uh, supporting documentation, basically all our articles that support all this. We've, we've put in a separate document as well and more so that you can look through that if, you, if, you, if you'd like to. So this is just uh, some of the things that happened on January 6th. And we've got some video. Maybe we'll jump ahead. We've got some video uh, coming up that we'd like to share about that day. That's but uh, a bit ahead. Yeah. And um, then... So, so then at the time, after the, after the actual rioting um, on January 6th, the next day then... Um, Twitter deleted uh, President Trump's uh, video calling for peace, which was very interesting. Um, they're saying that he didn't do, it, do enough that day. Um, YouTube suspended President Trump's channel for inciting violence. Okay, they haven't explained that quite yet. But um, so he was, they, they suspended his account. Zuckerberg banned President Trump from using Facebook indefinitely. And they're still discussing that at Facebook, by the way. They haven't decided quite yet if they're going to allow him to put his account back on. Um, but they're going to have another meeting, I think, in another six months. So this is still going on. Uh, Twitter executives uh, detailed plans for uh, political censorship on a global scale. Um, this, we're noticing, too, um, that this big tech ty tyranny is not just happening in the United States, but it's also happening in other countries. They've done similar things in Brazil, where the uh, President Bolsonaro, they were uh, uh, cracking down on, on, on social media there, deleting his account, censoring his account. So this is happening. Uh, it looks like Facebook and Twitter now get to decide who our world leaders are. So uh, they have this power all over the globe today. Uh, we were also suspended at that time, Gateway Pundit, for putting up this video of uh, the TCF Center in Detroit 
and we announced that we had more video coming, and so they took our account down at that time. So mm -hmm. this is what um, is happening. Um, it's frightening, and it's been happening. Uh, it was gradual at first, but when they knocked the president of the United States off of social media, I think, uh, you know, mm, it's, it's pretty clear that, uh, uh, there, that there's a lot of censorship going on and that it's not going to stop and that they just don't care. Mm. And so we've had a couple of slides here basically going back to COVID tyranny. It, it just continues. And um, the thing that, that we noticed as we looked at this period of time is that it's really confusing. Now, now, by this point in time, it's just confusing. Should we be wearing masks? Should we not? Some places don't have masks. Some places do. Some places have other uh, laws and regulations in place, mandates, and others don't. And so it became very very uh, confusing, I think, at this point in time. By February of 2021, Saki, uh, the White House uh, press, uh, what is she, secretary. the press sec secretary, she said, even after you're vaccinated, social distancing and wearing masks will be essential. So a lot of questions with what all was going on at that time. Yeah. We also saw this uh, going global, as we said. So Czech, Czech police are uh, tackling maskless, maskless uh, a young father, we're seeing uh, insane uh, policies uh, down under in Australia. Um, uh, we're seeing uh, a, a Calgary, this brave pastor in, in Calgary started shouting at the police to get out of his uh, church, uh, get out Nazis, he was screaming at them, that went viral. So a lot of people are starting to stand up and a lot of these uh, uh, different countries are starting to crack down on their citizens. Mm -hmm. And that kind of leads into the New World Order. We, we've had some slides and some articles over the past year and a half more, and even longer, about what's going on there. I think the one on March 6th was one I was going to highlight. China used the uh, coronavirus to destroy the freedoms of people in Hong Kong and punish protesters. T t till today, Hong Kong's under uh, strict regulations, basically, regarding to COVID. You, uh, there's, there's, they started banning people from going into certain locations. Now this month in, in Hong Kong, everybody, doesn't matter if you're vaccinated or not, has to go to and get, their, get a test three times during the month, a COVID test. And then they're going to send those results to China, but China's not going to keep that personal information on you. They're gonna, they just want to check and see if people have COVID or not. And then that information's, you know, going to, I guess, not, not really sure why they're doing it. Half the population there is, is, uh, has been vaccinated, if not more. So the airport there used to get a quarter million people through that airport every day. It's been down to like 5,000 uh, uh, people per day for now a couple of years. So basically, I think what's happening in, 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 China, in Hong Kong is that China's just punishing them. They had freedom, and we're going to punish them and make sure that they know that they're not going to have freedom going forward because that's what's happened. China has really just basically taken over Hong Kong in the last two years. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> I put this slide in there. This man there, his name was Eric Junger. He was a good friend of mine. He was 80 years old. He was in a nursing home. Um, they locked him up. All the seniors, of course, in the nursing homes were locked up for months. Uh, Eric called me in December of 2020 and said, Jim, uh, I just found out I have COVID. And I said to Eric, I, I asked him, Eric, so what do they have you on? Okay, you're 80 years old, you have diabetes, you have all these conditions, um, these comorbidities. What do they have you on? They, certainly they're giving you something, right? He said, they're not giving me anything. They're just, they're telling me I'm doing well. They're just going to see how I do. You know, they're just going to watch me, right? And I'm like, Eric, that isn't a treatment, okay? This, this infuriated me. I have a dear friend who is, comes down with COVID, overweight, all the things you know that you're worried about, and there's no treatment. Um, two weeks later, Eric died, okay? So his condition was fine when he got it, but he died. There was no treatment. In the meantime, I put this, uh, this, this tweet up there from the US FDA mocking people for suggesting that ivermectin would work as a, as a, as a treatment for the coronavirus. We called the Cleveland Clinic. We called doctors in St. Louis. I'm from St. Louis. We called, uh, spoke with uh, the top infectious disease doctor. We said, what is the treatment? They did not have a treatment 10 months into this thing, right? They didn't have a designated treatment. They blocked hydroxychloroquine. They blocked and smeared ivermectin. 
and uh, so they didn't have a treatment. So it's, it's, it's unbelievable to me that this was happening and um, uh, unconscionable. Uh, we put some numbers down. I'm just going to say this briefly. Um, there are a couple of websites that track coronavirus or, and, and hydroxychloroquine. And uh, there's been uh, one, it's uh, c19hcq.com. We have that on our, on our website. They've done 403 studies. They found that uh, the coronavirus, uh, that the HCQ works actually quite well if you give it to people as a prophylactic and early in the treatment. They have great success. It doesn't work as good when they're really sick. Same thing with ivermectin. There's another website out there. It's ivermectin, HC, uh, it's, it's, it's ivermectin uh, CCQ. Or, I'm sorry, I'll have to get that to you. Um, anyway, uh, oh, it's, it's c19ivermectin.com. Uh, they found 83% to 63% success with ivermectin um, if you have it early. So there was treatments out there that were just being blocked at the time. Okay. And then this is, uh, we, we had a video here. It's um, uh, Roseanne Boylan is on the ground here. This is January 6th. This didn't get any press. This woman was dead. They beat her and gassed her. And uh, one of the police officers there is beating her some more. Um, we, didn't, we didn't ever hear this side of the story on January 6th. Uh, today there are several people talking about uh, tyranny. There are several people locked up in uh, D.C., we have a website called uh, American Gulag, and uh, we track all these people in their cases, and uh, there's still 700 people have been arrested, at least 40, around 40 are still in the DC Gulag, and, um, uh, and, and they're still locked up. Uh, some have not even been in front of the judge. Uh, it's tragic what's happening, and um, this just, again, shows a lot more of the violence that day. Um, uh, but the sad thing is that they've taken away their rights of these people and they're still locked up in mm -hmm. prison. That's very significant yeah. development. And Jim has uh, put together a website called AmericanGulag.org where he, he lists all the individuals that have been arrested from January 6th, their personal stories, where they're at in their court cases, etc. cetera. Excellent, ex excellent piece of material. It's, it's, the lot has been invested into that and, and to just maintain it. And mm -hmm. it's an excellent place if you ever want to go to see what's going on. Um, yeah. And then uh, this next slide was, uh, uh, there's a, a, a friend of mine, Jeremy Brown, who was in, um, who was in the uh, uh, prison in, uh, in Pinellas County, Florida. He was at the, uh, he was at the uh, um, protest. He never went inside the building. He's been locked up now for seven, eight months, and yet somebody came and it was gonna bomb this protest and supported Jeremy Brown, this young Antifa activist. He got bailed out, um, the guy who was gonna be the bomber, and yet my friend Jeremy Brown is still in the prison. So let's go ahead to yeah. this piece. We're gonna play this, this is Joe Biden just uh, not long ago. You know, we are at an inflection 21st. point, I believe, in the world economy. Not just the world economy, in the world. It occurs every three or four generations. As one of, as the, uh, one of the top military people said to me in a secure meeting the other day, 60, 60 million people died between 1900 and 1946. And uh, since then, we established a liberal world order, and that hadn't happened in a long while. A lot of people died, but nowhere near the chaos. And that's it. Thank you. That was Joe Biden talking <laughs> about New World Order. I want to say thank you to Jim and Joe Hoft, and their website is thegatewaypundit.com for that insightful information. They have so much more. They just barely cracked the surface of all of the information that's on their website. As they had said, it's all available there. This presentation will be there as well. We made the executive's decision because their information is so good to let them take the full amount of the time that was available to them. And so audience, I'm sorry we didn't have time for questions and answers. We wanted to give them the bulk of the time. So audience, please, let's give a great round of applause to Jim and Joe Hoff.
it enough yeah, to Peter Mitchell. I'm for joining us again. Now we're, we'll hear from Mr. Leo Holman. His website is leoholman.com. That's L-E-O-H-O-H-M-A-N-N.com. Leo Holman is an investigative reporter. I've known him for a number of years. He's a courageous journalist who seeks out truth in order to educate his audience. And today, here at Regent University, Leo Holman will share his cutting-edge findings and warnings regarding the World Economic Forum. The World Economic Forum is at the forefront of advancing global governance today, and I highly encourage those who are watching online to send a text or send an email or go on your Facebook, invite your friends to hear Leo Holman's presentation and to join us now to hear this important message from Mr. Leo Holman. Leo? Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you for that introduction, Dean Bachman. I'm here today to talk about a new global system that maybe some of you haven't heard too much about, but it is rising up right now in our midst at this very moment in history on the world stage. Dr. Henry Kissinger and the late Zbigniew Brzezinski called it the New International Economic Order. That was back in the early 1970s. In fact, there's a great quote from Dr. Brzezinski that I love to share with my audiences. It comes from his book published in 1970 under the title, Between Two Ages, America's Role in the Technotronic Era. That book was dedicated, by the way, to his daughter, Mika Brzezinski, who still is a key player right now today in the information war being waged against we, the American people. This quote I'd like to share from his book sets the tone for my entire presentation. So let's read it together here and let it sink in. And remember, this was written 25 years before the internet and some 35 years before anyone heard of Facebook or Twitter. And uh, he writes, the technotronic era involves the gradual appearance of a more controlled society. Such a society would be dominated by an elite, unrestrained, by traditional values. Soon it will be possible to assert almost continuous surveillance over every citizen and maintain up-to-date complete files containing even the most personal information about the citizens. These files will be subject to instantaneous retrieval by the authorities." Unquote. Now, I don't know about you, but that quote written in 1970 was prophetic, and it was very revealing. What he's talking about there is a new global mo movement that would have been unheard of in his day, but it, it was the technocracy movement. Now, let's define technocracy. What do I mean by that? Technocracy, according to the great Patrick Wood in his book, Technocracy Rising, is, as he calls it, the science of social engineering. The science of social engineering. I like to refine that a little bit more and call it the science of human control. The end goal of technocracy is a dictatorship where the most powerful people in society are not politicians, but unelected experts, bureaucrats, scientists, engineers, and data collectors in both the public and private sector. President George Herbert Walker Bush referred to this emerging system in 1990 as the New World Order. Joe Biden echoed that claim just last week in his speech in Poland, where he said a New World Order was, on, was at the precipice, and he punctuated that by saying, quote, unquote, it's coming. Now it's fashionable among the elites today to reimagine the New World Order by calling it the Great Reset. That sounds less conspiratorial and much more 21st century. But it's really the same thing that the United Nations calls sustainable development or Agenda 2030 with its 17 sustainability goals outlined 1 through 17. You can go on their site and read them. Whatever you wish to call it, I agree with Mr. Biden, it is coming. The question is how will we respond Will Christians stand against it when it gets here? And is it right now at the very door? 
I believe it is. The major power center pushing the Great Reset lies within the World Economic Forum. Based in Davos, Switzerland, that organization is led in, by its founder, Dr. Klaus Schwab. He's an economist and an engineer uh, who is a citizen of Germany. It meets every year with the world's most powerful elites in attendance from all sectors of life, business, government, entertainment, academia, and technology. What we are talking about is the cultivation, cultivation of a system that I like to refer to as the Fourth Reich. I've also called it the beast system. It shares many of the values and worldview characteristics of the Third Reich, that being a belief in a new master race, the use of eugenics, technology, and zero tolerance for dissent. This system, when fully implemented, marks the end, in my opinion, of pluralistic America. The Nazis had the death camps for those who des they designated as unfit for society. The modern Western technocrats have big tech, big pharma, and plan, a Planned Parenthood network of abortion clinics to perform essentially the same task of weeding out undesirables. Both believe in a system of rewards and punishments based on how obedient you are to the system. Do not confuse what you're seeing see going on in America today with the communist revolution. In my uh, personal opinion, a lot of conservatives make that mistake. They think that we're undergoing a communist revolution. Unlike the communists of old, the Third and Fourth Reichs believe in using, not eliminating, the wealthy capitalists who engage in free enterprise. The high priests of the Fourth Reich like their ancestors in the Third Reich, are expert at using propaganda to create a cult of groupthink. They also call it the hive mind, if you will. The difference is that the Third Reich would throw you in a concentration camp if you did not conform to the propaganda messaging, whereas the leaders of the Fourth Reich would prefer to cancel you from your job, cancel you from your health care, your educational opportunities, and eventually they plan to cancel your bank account and therefore your ability to buy and sell. This will be uh, all done through what? Digital pa health passports, digital money, and a little QR code on your cell phone. Eventually, it will go under your skin. Klaus Schwab says we should expect a new type of human being, being uh, coming into emergence who will thrive in this type of a society. Under this system, you have no rights, only privileges. Driving a car, owning a single family home or a family farm, owning a firearm, even having access to health care or a bank account will all be among the privileges you, are e you will either qualify for or you won't. Biden, just two weeks ago, Joe Biden issued an executive order calling on several federal agencies to formulate a plan to create a new digital dollar, which will be designed to eventually replace our physical paper currency. This new currency will not only be digital, it will be programmable and trackable. That means everything you buy, where you bought it, how much you paid, will be tracked by the government in real time. Such privileges will be doled out based on how obedient you are in this, to the state and its corporate partners. Remember that part, corporate partners. What happened to the truckers in Canada when they did not stop their protests uh, when they were told to get out of the streets? The government talked it over with the banks and boom, within hours, their, account, their bank accounts were closed. Pay attention to how everything today is done in the name of PPPs. What are those? Public-private partnerships. Governments working in concert with private corporations. This is a much more powerful way of coercing their subjects to obey, especially in nations like the U.S. where we have a strong constitution and a history of limited government. Where the government is prevented from acting, they simply hand the ball off to their corporate partners, which employ millions of Americans and sign their paychecks. How did they get people to take the unproven experimental vaccine? They simply threatened their jobs. Now, 
I can switch to our next slide here. Uh, I've got to force behaviors and at BlackRock we are forcing behaviors. That man right there is Larry Fink. He is the president, founder, and CEO of the world's most powerful corporation, BlackRock. BlackRock owns between four and six, up to 10% or more of almost every major company in the world that you can think of. And what was he talking about here, forcing behaviors? The World Economic Forum, which he happens to also be on the board of trustees of, uh, is the premier voice, they consider themselves the premier voice of public-private partnerships. This is key to understanding their mission. Whenever you hear Biden or some other politician talk about our partners in the private sector, you know they're a globalist following the World Economic Forum template, a template for total world domina domination. They, don't re they do not represent you, the voter. They represent the interests of transnational corporations and the World Economic Forum. That's why the COVID response led to the demise of so many small businesses, while it was a gravy train for companies like Amazon, Walmart, Costco, and Home Depot. Look at the response to the uh, recent invasion of Russia into Ukraine. This was the first time in human history we saw a complete synchronization of government and private corporations. No sooner did the government say we want to put sanctions on Russia and McDonald's, you know, uh, G GE, all the major companies pulled immediately out of Russia and announced it with much fanfare. Now, the other thing we need to know about the people at the World Economic Forum is they are very much into the transhumanist agenda. They have no regard for humanity. They have no regard for personal liberty or the pursuit of happiness by independent, critical thinking citizens. God created us with a free will, right? But under the technocratic movement, you are denied ownership over everything. That includes not just your physical assets, but your body and even your mind. They say you will own nothing, have no privacy, but somehow you'll be happy. The new definition of happiness, of course, is you accepting the idea that you are no longer in control of your own body or thoughts. They tell you that the size of your house, they tell you what size of house you can live in, what type of car you can drive, how much energy you should be able to use per year, what your carbon footprint will be, right down to what you can eat. Meat, as the Hoffs uh, hinted in their presentation, meat is now evil. Gas-powered vehicles are evil. They intend to basically price you out of all these options as a middle-class American. The idea is to coax you into behavioral changes, as Larry Fink suggested. When the carrot doesn't work, they will switch to the stick. This requires, as Klaus Schwab says, changing not only our way of thinking, but changing you physically. How? By creating transhumans, or what they call humanity 2.0. How many of you are familiar with transhumanism? Transhumanism is the merging of man with machine to form a new hybrid being no longer fully human in the way that we think of humanity today. It's a whole new species. In their view, it's the process, it's the next stage of evolution. This will be achieved through gene editing and artificial intelligence driven by computer algorithms. Take a listen to what Mr. Schwab had to say about this subject, and this was back in 2016.
Aujourd'hui, au bout de ça, on parle de puces qu'on pourra s'implanter. Ce sera quand, ça Certainement dans les dix années à venir. Et d'abord, on va les implanter dans nos vêtements, uh -huh. c'est-à-dire wearables, comme on le dit. Et après, on pourrait s'imaginer qu'on les implante dans nos cerveaux ou dans nos topos. Et à la fin, peut-être il y a une communication directe entre notre cerveau et euh, la, le monde digital. Ce que nous voyons, c'est une sorte de fusion du monde physique, digital et biologique. On appelle quelqu'un, on n'a même plus le réflexe de devoir prendre un appareil, ça se fait naturellement. Hein. La, la, la technique continue le corps. Oui, vous, vous, vous parlez et vous dites, je veux maintenant euh, euh, être connecté avec n'importe qui. Hein? Et d'abord, vous avez les robots euh, personnalisés. Et j'ai vu que M. Zuckerberg euh, a prédit qu'à la fin de l'année, il va avoir son robot, son battler personnalisé ouais. qui est à sa disposition. Donc comme dans Downton Abbey, on aura son, son butler personnel, son serviteur, son esclave Oui, mais, mais il y a une différence. C'est un serviteur qui, avec euh, l'intelligence artificielle, apprend et qui n'est pas seulement euh, votre assistant pour des travaux manuels, qui peut vraiment être un partenaire intellectuel de vous. Okay, so you get an idea there of what he's thinking about in terms of transhumanism. I did want to, I didn't mean to skip over this one here. When Larry Fink is talking about forcing and using corporations to help force people to change their behaviors, this is just one small example of how uh, they're looking to change our behaviors. And this is the, just on the topic of transportation. They have behavioral change changes planned for every facet of your life and we don't have time to go into all of them but let's just look at one transportation uh, and Pete Buttigieg by the way is our transportation secretary right now he is a uh, graduate of Klaus Schwab's young global global leaders program at the World Economic Forum these are the policies that he is pushing they want to make public transportation cheaper so more people will will do ride on the public transit. They want to have car-free Sundays in large cities where the whole city on Sunday will be free of vehicles. Uh, they obviously want more people to work from home. They want alternative pri to private car use in large cities. Uh, promote efficient use of freight trucks and good delivery. Prefer high-speed trains to planes. Well, I wouldn't be here right now if I had to get on a train because there's you know, it would be much slower and I wouldn't have gotten here on time. But I don't count, you know, businesses need to change their behavior. And, okay, let's, let's talk about food shortages. You know, the, the whole idea... ...to the next one. Um, now, when we listen to Mr. Schwab and his, frankly, bizarre ideas about connecting people's brains to the Internet, where does he get these these ideas? Well, I did a little research and found out that they're not his own, even though he came out with a book, COVID-19 and the Great Reset, within basically two and a half months of COVID uh, being uh, discovered on the world scene. He came out with a book saying we need to use COVID to bring in this, these, new, uh, these new ways of controlling people. Uh, well, then I found out that his chief advisor, his chief advisor at the World Economic Forum is a man named Yuval Noah Harari. And Mr. Harari is an interesting character. He is a uh, professor of history at the university, at a university in Jerusalem, in Israel. He's fairly well known in Israel, but basically unknown here in the United States. He's the chief advisor to Mr. Schwab, and he says we are, quote, hackable animals as human beings, and as such, we can be reprogrammed. Let's take a look at uh, Mr. Harari. You know, the, the whole idea that humans have, you know, this, they, they have this soul or spirit and they have free will and nobody knows what's happening inside me. So whatever I choose, whether in the election or whether in the supermarket, this is my free will, that's over. Free will, that's over. That's over. Over. Today, we have the technology to hack human beings on a massive scale.
Yeah, I mean, everything is being digitalized. Everything is being monitored. In this time of crisis, you have to follow science. It's often said that you should never allow a good crisis to go to waste because a crisis is an opportunity to also do re good reforms that in normal times people will never agree to. But in a crisis, you see we have no chance, so, 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 so let's do it. The vaccine won't help us go the to the The vaccine will <laughs> help us, of course. It will make things you know, more manageable. Surveillance, people could look back in 100 years and identify the coronavirus epidemic as the moment when a new regime of surveillance took over, especially surveillance under the skin, which I think is maybe the most important development of the 21st century, is this ability to hack human beings, to go under the skin, collect biometric data, analyze it, and understand people better than they understand themselves. This. I believe is maybe the most important event of the 21st century. By hacking organisms, elites may gain the power to re-engineer the future of life itself. Because once you can hack something, you can usually also engineer it. Natural selection is replaced by intelligent design. The era of inorganic life is now beginning. In the coming decades, AI and biotechnology will give us godlike abilities to re-engineer life, and even to create completely new life forms. We are about to enter a new era of inorganic life shaped by intelligent design. Our intelligent design. Okay, so that is bizarre sounding, I know, but please do not make the mistake of thinking that this young man, I think he's about 45, is just sort of uh, a pie-in-the-sky daydreamer. This is the guy that the world's elites have called a prophet. Barack Obama called him his favorite author. He's been praised by Bill Gates, Mark Zuckerberg, and of course Schwab. And so uh, this is a man that we should listen to because while what he's saying sounds bizarre, he's thinking two, three, five to ten years down the road. So while the God of the Bible has created you in his image with a body, soul, and spirit, people like Schwab, Gates, and Harari deny all of that. They do see the essence of the human being as triune, similar to the body, soul, and spirit. But instead of that, they see a physical, biological, and digital identity. You saw Schwab referring to that and saying, in the fourth industrial revolution, which is upcoming, part of the Great Reset, these three identities, your biological, physical, and digital identity, will all be fused into one. This is Satan's, in my opinion, this is Satan's counterfeit, a perversion of God's crowning achievement in creation. Satan is using transhumanism, seeking to re recreate the human species according to man's idea of what makes the perfect person. Are you starting to see now this yes, system differs from we, standard we communism? This is why I say we are not being taken over by communists. They're simply one of the many tools on the way to a technotronic utopia. Useful idiots, idiots if you will. We are being taken over by something even more sinister. Global predators who adhere to a type of fascism, only I believe it's much more subtle than World War II German version of fascism. The modern, the modern technocratic dictatorship operates under the assumption that the best slave is one who thinks he is free. The great novelist Aldous Huxley understood this and predicted it back in 1931 when he said, quote, the perfect dictatorship would be the appearance of a democracy, but would basically be a prison without walls in which the prisoners would not even dream of escaping. It would essentially be a system of slavery where through consumption and entertainment, the slaves would love their servitudes, unquote. The key there is deception. They woo you in with their exciting technology and lies about how it will make your life better, more convenient, more productive, safe, and secure. They use all the buzzwords. This is more dangerous, in my opinion, than Stalin's use of brute force. Whereas the old Soviet Union communists crushed the churches, 
The Fourth Reich, just like its predecessor in the Third Reich, believes it can co-opt the churches. Only those churches that do not buy into the system will be persecuted. Like the, Third War, like the Third Reich before it, the Fourth Reich worships science and data and uses it to its advantage, not yours. Science and data get weaponized against their opponents. If you dissent from their narrative, you are not, quote, following the science. In terms of propaganda, they have weaponized not only the media, but the public education systems against the principles of the Bible and our Constitution. Now there are some differences, I'm going to point out, between the Third Reich and the Fourth Reich. Instead of being nationalist like the Third Reich, the Fourth Reich is globalist. Instead of cultivating obedient citizens of Germany or Austria, they want global citizens with no love of any particular nation. That's why they're in the business of destabilizing nations right now. Violent crime, open borders, the drugging of America, the circuses, the inflation, stoking racial divisions, that all plays into destabilization. Before you can have the Great Reset, you must have the Great Collapse. That's why they weaponize everything and go from one crisis to the next until the West, in particular the United States, is totally destabilized. Remember Harari's statement that we just heard a second ago on the screen. They must take advantage of crises because it is only in a crisis that you can get people to go along with radical changes that they would normally resist. Schwab, Klaus Schwab, has said that COVID should be used as a, quote, narrow window of opportunity to transform society and that these changes will be permanent. So in the end, they've weaponized the public education system. They've weaponized the media. They've weaponized the border, 200,000 people per month coming in. We don't know who they are. Weaponized the health care system everything with a singular goal in mind, the collapse of the United States of America as we know it. Harari said that pandemics would be used in particular to usher in this new system that he and Schwab have called the Great Reset, that others have called the New World Order, and that I'm calling the Beast System. Now, I believe the biggest crises are yet to come that COVID-19 was just the first phase. But the pandemics did serve its purpose. It got people used to obeying unscientific, illogical rules, wearing a mask that doesn't protect you, conducting more of your life online as opposed to in person, learning to accept your employer dictating to you what your healthcare decisions should be, to the point of receiving regular injections of an unknown chemical substance, they want you to believe it's impossible to look at someone and know whether they're male or female. The Bible says God created us as male and female, so they must say the opposite, and you must believe them. This whole thing is built around a system of rewards and punishments. Remember in George Orwell's 1984 novel, his classic book, 1984, Winston and you remember he was sitting in this interrogation room and his, interrogation, his interrogator held up three fingers. And he asked Winston, how many fingers do I have up? And Winston kept saying three, but that was the wrong answer. Winston had to say it was four because, that, because the party told him it was four. Winston could not be released back into, into society until he believed that the number was whatever his interrogator told him it was, not what he saw with his own eyes. It's the same today. That's why the Supreme Court nominee, Judge Jackson, just last week said she could not define what makes a woman because she knew that that definition could change tomorrow and she would have been on record with the wrong answer. So they accomplished a lot from this last crisis, the pandemic, but they've got a problem. They discovered that roughly 70% of America was willing to abide by any and all of these nonsensical edicts. 
The lockdowns of small businesses and churches while Walmart and liquor stores were allowed to stay open. The constant testing and quarantining of healthy people. At least 70% of Americans believed all these lies and they obeyed, either out of fear of the virus or fear of their fellow citizens, peer pressure. But here's the problem. They were unable to manipulate, they were able to manipulate 70%, but they still have 30% to contend with, the resistors. How do they plan to bring them into line? You can't have a great reset, which claims to fundamentally transform every facet of our lives with 30% of the people in the world's most prosperous country, the U.S., opting out. UN Agenda 2030 openly states that this is the plan for all people, everywhere. No person will be left behind. That's a direct quote from the agenda. That's why the globalists at the World Economic Forum have at least two or three more crises in their bag of tricks. They have talked about a coming massive cyber attack that would target our banking system and possibly our electric grid. They've been talking openly about World War III for the first time in my life. I was born in the early 60s. World War III with Russia. They've been talking about severe food shortages. No one alive in America has ever heard this kind of talk from an American president, but now we're hearing it from Joe Biden. So talk about food shortages. And, uh, and it's going to be real. The, the price of these sanctions is not just imposed upon Russia. It's imposed upon an awful lot of countries as well, including European countries and our country as well. And uh, because both uh, Russia and Ukraine have been the breadbasket of Europe in terms of wheat, for example, just to give one example. But <clears throat> we had a long discussion uh, in the G7 with, uh, um, the, uh, with both uh, the United States, which has a, as a significant, the third largest producer of wheat in the world, as well as Canada, which is also a major, major producer. And we both talked about how we could increase and disseminate more rapidly food, food shortages. And in addition to that, we talked about uh, urging all the European countries and everyone else to end trade restrictions on on sending uh, limitations on sending food abroad, and so we are in the process of working out with our European. You know, the because he he will drone on forever. I'll come. Uh, there's no better way to destabilize a nation, a region, or the world than to create food shortages. And here you have a president admitting that his own policy is going to create food shortages. Biden said they're going to mitigate those food shortages by sending more food out of the U.S. to other countries, while at the same time he's opening our borders and inviting the world to come here. That sounds to me like a recipe for disaster, and I expect food rationing and bread lines perhaps within the next year here in America. None of this is incompetence. It's all by design. Gas prices, $4 a gallon, that's not by accident. Food prices uh, soaring and eventually food shortages. None of that will be an accident. They've already foretold it. They must collapse the U.S. dollar-based global economy before they can fully implement the Great Reset, the crowning achievement of which will be a digital global money system and a digital global ID system. That's when you have the final phase of the Great Reset and the onset of the long-coveted New World Order. Whether they are successful or not depends on you. Will you blindly walk into their trap during the next crisis, or will you resist? Thank you. Leo Holman, thank you so much for that great presentation. It's tough to hear, but important to hear. Again, Leo Holman, L-E-O-H-O-H-M-A-N-N.com. He's an investigative reporter. Well, our next speaker you're going to enjoy, his name is Dr. Michael Rechtenwald. He is the Chief Academic Officer of American Scholars. 
Dr. Rechtenwald is another expert on the World Economic Forum, and he will expand our understanding of this critical organization that seeks to redefine our existence, as Leo Holman just told us. Dr. Rechtenwald's work has been read by millions of people. As I urge you to with Leo Holman, would you please invite others that you know right now to listen to Dr. Rechtenwald's important message. Would you please join me in giving a warm Regent University welcome to Dr. Michael Rechtenwald. Thank you very much, Dean Bachman. It was great to uh, it's great to be here, and I appreciate the invitation. And I was a little nervous about speaking, but after watching Biden, the President of the United States, <laughs> I figure I couldn't do worse, and I certainly don't have that uh, function. So, now is the Great Reset a conspiracy theory? This seems to be the question. Is it a vast uh, left-wing plot? to establish a totalitarian world government? No, it is not a conspiracy theory, even though some people have spun conspiracy theories based on it, and with good reason, as we shall see. The Great Reset is real. Indeed, in June 2020, Klaus Schwab, founder and executive chairman of the World Economic Forum, and Thierry Malaret, published a book called COVID-19, The Great Reset. In the book, they define The Great Reset as a means of addressing the weaknesses of capitalism that were purportedly exposed by the COVID epidemic, pandemic. But the idea of The Great Reset goes back much further. It can be traced at least as far back uh, to the, as the inception of the World Economic Forum, originally founded as the European Management Forum in 1971. In that same year, Schwab, an engineer and economist by training, published his first book, Modern Enterprise Management and Mechanical Engineering. It was this book, uh, in this book, that Schwab first introduced the concept of what he later called stakeholder capitalism. Uh, and I will explain what stakeholder capitalism is soon. Schwab and the WEF have promoted the idea of stakeholder capitalism ever since. They can take credit for the stakeholder and public-private partnership rhetoric and policies embraced by governments, corporations, non-governmental organizations, and international governance bodies worldwide. In 2018 and 2019, two key events took place that became a primary inspiration for the current Great Reset project, and for obvious reasons they provided fresh fodder for conspiracy theories, so-called. Please don't blame me for the latter. All I'm doing is relating the historical facts. In May of 2018, the WEF collaborated with the John Hopkins Center for Health Security to conduct Clade X, a simulation of a national pandemic response. In October of 2019, the WEF collaborated with John Hopkins and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation on another pandemic exercise, Event 201, which simulated, simulated an international response to the outbreak of a novel coronavirus. This was two months before the COVID outbreak in China became news and five months before the World Health Organization declared it a pandemic and it closely resembled the future COVID scenario, including incorporating the idea of asymptomatic, asymptomatic spread. The Clade X and Event 201 simulations anticipated almost every eventuality of the COVID crisis, most notably the responses by governments, health agencies, the media, tech companies, and elements of the public. The, the simulated responses and their effects uh, included worldwide lockdowns. This is all simulated two months before Corona. Worldwide lockdowns, the collapse of businesses and industries, the adoption of biometric surveillance technologies, an embrace of social media, an emphasis on social media to combat misinformation and disinformation, the flooding of social and legacy media with authoritative sources, widespread riots, i.e. the mostly peaceful protests, 
and mass unemployment. <clears throat> in addition to being promoted as a response to COVID, however, the Great Reset is promoted as a response to climate change. On June 2019, the WEF signed a Memorandum of Understanding with the United Nations to form a partnership, the UN 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. Shortly after that, the WEF published the United Nations World Economic Forum uh, Strategic Partnership Framework for Agenda 2030. They promised, the WEF did, to finance the UN's ch climate change agenda and committed the uh, WEF to help the UN meet the needs of the fourth industrial revolution mentioned by, discussed by Leo, including providing access and expertise for digital governance digital governance. In June 2020, at its 50th annual meeting, the WEF announced the Great Reset's official launch. A month later only, Schwab and Malaret published their book, COVID-19, The Great Reset. In this book, they declared, and I looked up this word opportunity, and they used the word opportunity 17 times. I'll give you a few examples. They declared that COVID represents, quote, an opportunity that can be seized, that, quote, we should take advantage of this unprecedented, op unprecedented opportunity to reimagine our world, that the moment must be seized to take advantage of this unique window of opportunity, that for those fortunate enough to find themselves in industries naturally resistant to the pandemic, think here of big tech companies like Apple, Google, Facebook, and Amazon, the crisis was not only more bearable, but even a source of profitable opportunities at a time for, of distress for the majority. The Great Reset usher, aims to usher in a bewildering economic amalgam. Schwab's stakeholder capitalism, uh, and this is the title of one of his books, which I have called and you'll understand why as I explain this, corporate socialism, corporate socialism, in which Italian philosopher Giorgio Agamben has called communist capitalism. In brief, uh, stakeholder capitalism involves the behavioral modification of corporations to benefit not only shareholders, but stakeholders, individuals or groups that supposedly stand to benefit or lose from corporate behavior. They make it sound very benign and they use very euphemistic language. Stakeholder capitalism, however, involves corporate reporting and control of every aspect of doing business, including what businesses may produce, what materials they may use, uh, including what kinds of persons they may hire, uh, wh what kind of identity these persons have. Uh, and then they also <coughs> require uh, stakeholder capitalism requires not only corporate responses to pandemics and ecological issues such as climate change, but also rethinking their commitments to already vulnerable communities within their ecosystems. And what they're talking about there is the social justice aspect of the Great Reset. The hiring and promotion of supposedly beleaguered minorities or affirmative action on steroids, effectively. Basically, this idea that they will control boards, uh, uh, the uh, management, and so forth, and even the constitution of the employee base, regardless of, uh, of, uh, of capabilities. So to comply with that, governments, banks, and asset managers use the Environmental, Social, and Governance Index. Uh, and what they use this for is to benefit the ESG-abiding companies, that is, those who abide by this index, and to squeeze non-woke corporations and businesses out of the market. This is a, 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 this is a classic a monopolization scheme. The ESG index is essentially a Chinese-style social credit system score system that is used to drive ownership and control of production away from the non-woke or non-compliant. Soon, it will be applied to individuals. They're already floating the idea of the individual ESG score. How, how well do you abide by the environmental, social, and governance indexes? Now, one of the WEF's many powerful uh, strategic partners who was mentioned already, BlackRock Inc., 
the world's largest asset manager. They don't own all this stock. They manage the stock and they control where the investments go. They're solid be, solidly behind the stakeholder model. In 2019, BlackRock Inc.'s CEO, Larry uh, Fink, led a U.S. business roundtable during which the CEOs from 181 major corporations redefined the purpose of a corporation in terms of sh stakeholder capitalism, signaling the supposed end to shareholder-driven capitalism. This is significant. 181 major corporations have signed on to stakeholder capitalism. <clears throat> now, the WEF has over 1,000 corporate partners, by the way. In his 2021 letter to CEOs, Larry Fink made firm his position on investment decisions, declaring that, quote, climate risk is investment risk, and, quote, the creation of sustainable index investments has enabled a massive acceleration of capital towards companies better prepared to address climate risk. Fink promised a tectonic shift in investment behavior, an, an increasing acceleration of investments going to sustainability-focused companies. Now, this is the largest asset manager in the world. Fink warned CEOs, and because this will have such a dramatic impact on how capital is allocated, Every management team and board will need to consider how this will impact their company's stock. Now, Fink's letter also urged every company to provide a net zero plan. And thus throwing down the stakeholder gauntlet, Fink echoed the menacing words of Klaus Schwab, who in June 2020 wrote, and I have to imitate him, every country from the United States to China must participate and every industry from oil, gas, to tech must be transformed. <laughs> In short, we need a great reset of capitalism. Uh, Fink's 2022 letter to CEOs, The Power of Capitalism, strangely titled, continues the strong-armed advancement of stakeholder capitalism, suggesting that stakeholder capitalism has always been the modus operandi of corporations. According to Fink, Stakeholder capitalism is not an aberration. It is not a social or ideological agenda, he says. He contends it is not woke. It is capitalism. Fink's recent letters to CEOs are more than reports or suggestions. They represent an implicit threat. Go woke or go broke. In their book on the Great Reset, Schwab and Mallorette, pit stakeholder capitalism against neoliberalism, as they call it, defining the latter as, quote, a corpus of ideas and policies favoring competition over solidarity, creative destruction over government intervention, and economic growth over social welfare, as if those are opposed, economic growth and social welfare. In other words, neoliberalism refers to the free market system. And this is what they want to get rid of. In opposing that system, stakeholder capitalism entails corporate cooperation with the state and vastly increased government intervention in industry. Uh, proponents of the Great Reset hold neoliberalism responsible for all of our economic woes. But in blaming the free market, Schwab and company are actually complaining about the very thing that they're causing. Uh, the real problem is not uh, capitalism or the free market, corporatism, otherwise known as economic fascism, involves the politicization of the economy and the coordinated production and running of society by a consortium of dominant interest groups or exactly what the WEF promotes. If anything, stakeholder capitalism is a form of corporatism. Furthermore, contrary to St uh, Fink's assertion, the corporatism that he advances uh, that he does involve the exercise of corporate power and relies on state sanctions to perceive, perceive, uh, per, produce a particular ideological and political agenda. And that agenda is wokeness. Woke capitalism is thus better thought of as woke corporatism or woke fascism. While approved corporations are not necessarily monopolies, the tendency of the Great Reset is toward monopolization. 
vesting as much control over production and distributed distribution to as few favored corporations as possible while eliminating industries and producers deemed non-essential or inimical, especially oil producers. So this is a vast, this is a vast monopoly scheme. Another way of describing the goal of the Great Reset is capitalism with Chinese characteristics. Now, this is a play on the Chinese, capitalist, uh, Chinese Communist Party's own slogan, socialism uh, with uh, Chinese characteristics. What it really amounts to is what Murray Rothbard called state capitalism. And state capitalism is the system under which the state divvies out the control of all industries to preferred corporate cartels. In the case of the Great Reset, I call them the woke cartels. Uh, so what happened is in the, the 70s, after Mao's death, Deng Xiaoping uh, basically said, we need to reformulate our economy. It's crashing, you know. It was a disaster. Uh, production had gone down. Uh, the standard of living was, was falling. So you know, all the wonders of Chinese economy really comes down to implementing a for-profit system in, in, controlled by the state. And they called it socialism with Chinese characteristics. The idea, they thought, was that this would only be a short period of time under which communism would be uh, supplemented with, a capital, with capitalism. But after 100 years, after all these people were dead, in other words, after 100 years, then they could get to full communism. So they had to go through capitalism to get through communism because this is what Marx said, that socialism only follows capitalism. It has to come first. Um, now, they, they said basically that China needed a capitalist booster shot. Uh, but stripped of its socialist uh, pretensions, the Chinese system amounts to a socialist or communist state increasingly funded by capitalist economic development. The Great Reset represents the development of the Chinese system in the West only in reverse. Whereas the Chinese political class began with a socialist political system and then introduced privately held for-profit production, the West began with capitalism and is introducing Chinese -style political, a Chinese-style political system now. Now, I don't think it's fascism. I think it's more like corporate socialism, and I'll explain why. This Chinese-style system uh, includes vastly increased state intervention in the economy on the one hand, and the kind of authoritarian measures that the Chinese government uses to control its population on the other. Schwab and Malaret write, if the past five centuries in Europe and America have taught us anything, it is that, quote, acute crises contribute to boosting the power of the state. It has always been the case, and there is no reason it should be different with the COVID-19 pandemic. So the draconian lockdowns, as we've already heard, uh, were employed by Western governments. They managed to accomplish goals which corporate socialists in the WEF could only dream. Above all, the destruction of small businesses, eliminating competitors for corporate monopolists. In the U.S. alone, according to the uh, Foundation for Economic Education fee, uh, millions of small businesses closed their doors due to lockdowns, and Yelp in data indicates that 60% of those closures became permanent. Meanwhile, companies like Amazon, Apple, Facebook, and Google enjoyed record gains. You know, it really vexed me. How was it that you had these massive capitalist corporations, Amazon, Facebook, Google, uh, Twitter, all these, and they're espousing socialist rhetoric and promote, promoting socialists on their websites? I explain all that. That's what, that's what I tried to solve, that riddle. Uh, so this basically, the, the, uh, the, just as predicted, the COVID crisis ushered in an acceleration of the Great Reset, uh, monopolization, increasing monopolization on top, and actually existing socialism for everybody on the ground. That's the phrase that dissidents in the Soviet Union used to describe what socialism was really like, actually existing socialism. Now, on to the governance aspect uh, of this. The stakeholder model of public-private partnerships uh, and corporations in league with the state 
uh, spills into the governance model of the Great Reset. Uh, woke corporatism not only involves the interjection of government into business affairs, it also places corporations in decision-making positions within governments. Defined by the, uh, crafted by the WEF after the 2008 economic crisis, the Global Redesign Initiative it contains a 600-page report on transforming global governance. In the WEF's vision, quote, the government voice would be one among many without always being the final arbiter. Well, who's the other part? The other part is the corporate, corporate part. This configuration yields a corporate state hybrid that is largely unaccountable to the constituencies of national governments. Uh, Terence Corcoran of the Financial Post writes, the growing popularity of government-run industrial policy is one side of a bad economic coin that's circulating through Canada and American political circles, I would say through the entire West. The other movement taking shape simultaneously in corporate circles proposes to install corporations as global arbiters and enforcers of environmental, social, and governance policies. With the first, via industrial policy, the state, the state takes a heavy hand in running the private economy. With the other, the ESG, corporations play a large role in set, setting and controlling policies usually assigned in a constitutional democracy to the state. After all, these are supposedly uh, elected representatives that are supposed to represent us. Instead, we have corporate hy a corporate uh, state hybrid. Uh, this will be growing in, in, uh, pre uh, in, in, in size as time goes on. We saw it already with the COVID crisis, the way corporations came in and acted as apparatuses of the state in order to punish and uh, control the population. <clears throat> so governance is not only, though, under this plan, not only is the governance privatized to a large extent, which would be the cry of the left, oh no, look at the privatization, but also, and more importantly, corporations are deputized as major additions to governments and international bodies, intergovernmental bodies. That is to say, the the corporations become state appendages, in effect. Thus, the Great Reset involves the surreptitious subversion of democratically elected governments. So this is how we can say, finally, why it is totalitarian in nature, because we don't have any say in what's happening, and it's totalizing. Now, we've heard a bit about the Fourth Industrial Revolution already, but I'll talk a little bit more about it. Most of the ideas for the Fourth Industrial Revolution came from people like Ray Kurzweil in his book, The Singularity is Near, Near and other such tomes, which, which vaunted the coming of this new transhuman individual, or non-individual, really, <laughs> uh, this new transhuman blob, really. Uh, so the Fourth Industrial Revolution is definitely part of this Great Reset, and Klaus Schwab wrote a book by this very title. Uh, the 4IR, as I'll call it for short, marks the convergence of existing and emerging fields including big data, artificial intelligence, machine learning, quantum computing, genetics, nanotechnology, and robotics. The foreseen result will be, as Leo mentioned, the merging of the physical, physical digital, and biological worlds. Some of the proposed and already developed uh, elements include Digital identities, not, not digital IDs, digital identities. This is be, the difference between an ID and an identity is an identity is a collection of everything about you by which every digital action that one takes, every click of a mouse or, or, or a pad is recorded, collated, and connected with one's digital identity. This is a, con a, co a concatenation of all of your activity. The Internet of Things, uh, all resources given a digital identity, so everything will be tracked. Uh, the Internet of Bodies, all resources, I'm sorry, all people given a digital identity, as I said. CB, uh, CBDC, or Central Bank Digital Currency, by which every financial tra uh, transaction will be known and some even precluded. Uh, smart Cities 
where every action one takes is tracked and traced, reported to a centralized database, and attached to a social credit score, likely the personal ESG. And so, in short, I would say, if not taken out of the hands of these corporate socialists, uh, the 4IR technology will entail, or could entail, a virtual prison of body and mind. Uh, now, other more pedestrian elements that have uh, advanced the Great Reset have included unfettered immigration, travel restrictions for otherwise legal border, border crossing, the Federal Reserve's unrestrained printing of money and the subsequent inflation, increased taxation, increased dependence on the state, broken supply chains, and the prospect of personal carbon allowances. That is part of your ESG. How much carbon are you allowed to, uh, are you allowed to use? Such policies reflect the fairness aspect of the Great Reset. All the language they use is euphemistic and uh, doublespeak, okay? Fairness requires lowering the economic status of people in wealthier nations like the U.S. relative to the rest of the world like people in the third world. They're not going to create fairness by elevating anyone. The fairness is a, it's a downward-based egalitarianism. Uh, this is where woke ideology comes in, and this will be in addition to some things that have been said. Well, what could wokeness have to do with the Great Reset? I mean, what's the possible connection here? Well, let's think about this. Wokeness is not aimed at the sufferers or supposed, supposed sufferers and the sufferings it, it is supposed to redress. The wokeness, no, it works on the majority, the supposed beneficiaries of injustice. It does so by making the majority understand that it has benefited from privilege and preference. Skin color, sexual proclivity, and gender identification are amongst the list of growing, a growing list of culprits. So the majority must be re rehabilitated. In order to affect a great reset, it has to have an ideological component. The masses must understand that they have gained whatever advantage that they have hitherto enjoyed, including their freedom, based on the unfair treatment of others, either directly or indirectly, and this unfair treatment is predicated on the circumstances of birth. So what are the expected attitudinal and behavioral adjust adjustments to be taken by the majority? They are to expect less, so much so that they will be expected to eat insects for protein instead of meat, and I'm not kidding. They, they advertise this, uh, they publicize this on the World Economic Forum, and there are companies in Israel making this insect paste. Um, and they're calling it biblical protein, by the way. Watch out for the lies. Wokeness works by habituating the majority to the reduced expectations of the Great Reset. Uh, it indoctrinates the majority into the propertyless future, for them at least, of the Great Reset objectives. So. Let's back up a little bit. Is this Great Reset a conspiracy theory? I mean, it's a, is this just a conspiracy? I think that I've, I've shown and we've seen this is an avowed plan. Uh, it has many discrete and moving parts. Uh, there are the economic parts, and that's very important. And I think the economics can be described as communist capitalism, corporate socialism, economic fascism, uh, or state capitalism. All those things are effectively congruent. Then there is, of course, the governance part. All that has to do with is the way corporations and states become partners in governing, and the way governance is then basically offshored to corporations who bring their massive assets to the table, including the technological assets that help monitor, control, and co uh, collect data on each and every one of us. So that's what they bring to the table. And then, of course, there's the 4IR element, which is the technology aspect and all of the various developments uh, up to and, and possibly inclusive of transhumanism, which also includes the prospect, by the way, of using nanotechnology, what they call side of smart dust, that you could actually not take voluntarily, but might be induced by a firm handshake or even floating in the air between you and someone else, 
It attaches to the uh, neurons of the, ne of the neocortex and allows information flows in and out of the neurons. This is under development. I worked in robotics at Carnegie Mellon in an AI lab. This is really happening. Okay, this is not fake. I'm not talking about something completely far off in the future. They're already developing this technology now. Um, so it might not be chips. I think it'll likely be nanobots. Uh, and then, of course, there is the ideological component, which is wokeness, I believe. So really, when you hear about wokeness, it's not some stupid way of, for Twitter people to attack you or be attacked by Twitter mobs. It's not just cancel culture. It is the indoctrination of the majority into this future of less, expecting less, and getting less. Um, so, but let me end on a note of hope, if I may. Uh, because the goals of the Great Reset uh, depend on the obliteration of the free market, uh, also of individual liberty and free will, it is perhaps ironically unsustainable. That is to say, they, <laughs> we can reappropriate their language of sustainability and suggest that this is unsustainable. From an economic standpoint, it will crash because you cannot have a thriving economy that destroys the middle class. Uh, this is known very well. And, you know, they point to China's success as, a, as a, an example, but they're really, really stupid in thinking that China would have risen to where it was without the consumer base of the free market in the U.S. and the West to buy their products. So, you know, when you destroy the free market, there will be a crash. Uh, there is no other way, as uh, Ludwig von Mises pointed out. You cannot, there is, there is no socialism. There's never been socialism because it doesn't work at all. It never can be affected. So socialism is always ideological and political when it comes down to it. Uh, it is unsustainable. Like the other attempts at totalitarian control, I believe the Great Reset is doomed to fail. But this doesn't mean that in the process it won't, like the earlier attempts, leave tremendous destruction in its wake and untold suffering, well, most of which would be the loss of human potential and purpose. This is the main crux of the issue, the loss of human potential and purpose. This is all the more reason to oppose it with all the resources at our disposal. This is why I have been talking to congresspersons about this, uh, the Conservative Opportunity Society and other groups, uh, and why we must try to pressure our legislators into doing something to stop these processes. So they need to know what they are first. And that's what our job is to do, is to inform them to divest from ESG abiding companies. It's very difficult to get your assets out of certain uh, stocks. For example, if you're in mutual funds, how do you know which of these companies are in invest or abiding by ESG dictates and enforcing woke dictates in, on everyone else? But it's doable. And there are funds that are available that are outside of that aegis. And then building parallel economic and political structures. Because if they're going to crush the free market, we must keep it alive, even as a vestige, as a remnant, in order for the future to inherit. Because without that, we will have nothing to have handed off. We must keep the free market alive. We must do it by virtue of exchange and production. We must become, each of us, more entrepreneurial. Because you can't be canceled from yourself yet. Uh, and so the idea here is to become as independent economically as you can. I'm not saying everybody has got to be independently wealthy. I mean independently oriented and, uh, and less reliant on institutions that could destroy you in a heartbeat. Uh, and there are many other things we should do, not the least of which is to pray, frankly, uh, because we're up against a behemoth. Uh, a beast system, and it has to be stopped. 
Thank you very much. Dr. Rechtenwald, thank you so much for that wonderful, wonderful message. Leo Homan and Dr. Michael Rechtenwald will return to the stage for your questions following our next presentation from United States Senator Rand Paul. begin to understand that as a leader, bold choices have to be made. If we are a dedicated and committed people, making the world a better place to be is what it's all about. Regent is going to bring you into a community where everyone is different, but we all have one purpose, and that is to grow in leadership so that we can change this world. Thank you so much for reuniting with us now during this point. We're so grateful to have with us Dr. Michael Rechtenwald and also Mr. Leo Holman. Uh, Senator Rand Paul will be joining us. He's running a little bit late with the votes. He's live in Washington, D.C. And so now we will uh, join Leo Holman and Dr. Michael Rechtenwald as they interact with each other about what they've heard each other say. Gentlemen, go ahead. Leo, would you like to begin? Yes, absolutely. Uh, as I was listening to your presentation, uh, I was struck by uh, several elements. One thing that at, towards the end there that you talked about uh, was, you know, how do we resist this system? And you talked about the parallel society. I thought that was very interesting. It's something I've talked about as well, and I've never met this man here until today, and yet we were on the same track there. Um, one thing that jumped into my mind as you were expressing yourself in that vein was the biblical uh, admonition in Revelation, it's either chapter 17 or 18, where it says, come out of her, my people. And it's almost like God is warning us that this beast system would be uh, emerging at this, in these, at this end time uh, period of history. And... Uh, there's so many, you know, ways that we could come out, but the warning is there, and if you don't, it says, come out lest you share in the world's sins and the world's plagues. And uh, you can see we're already seeing the plagues, and, and, and this is heading now towards food shortages, possible world war. Um, so I was very impressed by, by that part of your presentation. One question I had for you, though, when you meet with these politicians, you said that you, you, you go around talking with them on the phone or in person, whatever, uh, and, and, and spelling this out for them. What is the reaction that you typically get? Are they surprised? Do they have any inkling of what's going on? And, and are they open to any solutions that you might give them? Oh, yeah, I think uh, that's a great question. Yeah, they have... Uh a, a sense of what's happening, I think. They're, they're not clueless about all this. And certainly, what I was trying to do is connect all the pieces together to show them how everything is interrelated. Um, so I think they have... Uh, we, we talked about possible ways of them actually doing something legislatively. And uh, uh, some of the things have to do with, for example, many states... Larry Fink doesn't just manage uh, the, the investment portfolios of 
billionaires. He has many state pensions under his control in the United States. So he's controlling the money of many states. Mm -hmm. So I said, you know, go, go back. To, these were congresspersons. Go back to your states and talk to your legislators there and get them to recognize this and divest from these Larry Fink held asset, uh, assets and uh, things like that and also to enact legislation. I don't know what shape that would take. I'm not a legislator, so I've never written legislation or uh, ever considered uh, proposing any as such. But, I, you know, legislation could block a lot of these kinds of uh, developments. Uh, human rights legislation might be necessary in order to fend off transhumanist developments, uh, just to make it, you know, illegal to uh, surreptitiously uh, connect somebody, somebody's brain to the web using uh, smart dust, uh, things like that. Um, but we, we don't, I don't think it's going to be limited to just these players that it could get in the hands of uh, different elements. And uh, so it's going to be very hard to legislate, frankly. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, they're very aware uh, of a lot of the elements that I was talking about. That I don't think that they had heard it put together as such before. Mm -hmm. Did you have a follow-up question to that? Did you react? One quick further question. Yeah, you mentioned uh, Dr. Rechtenwald, Event 201, and how that was held just two months before the onset of COVID yeah. uh, as sort of dress rehearsal on how the governments would react, the business community would react, the media would got all of its messaging, you know, on board with each other. Uh, well, that concerns me because they've also been holding simulations for a major cyber attack. Mm -hmm. When I see, say they, I'm referring to the World Economic Forum, the same one of the co-sponsors of Event 201, the forum also co-sponsored an event called Cyber Polygon mm -hmm. last summer, I believe in July, mm -hmm. uh, where they forecast a major cyber attack that would uh, attack our banking and financial system and possibly the electric grid. And so uh, do you foresee that, that happening? Well, you know, either the World Economic Forum is the most prophetic organization <laughs> on the face of the earth or something else. And I'm not going to say what that something else might be. I'll leave that to conjecture. Others can draw their own conclusions. Yeah. Um, but the prescience that they have displayed has been very uncanny, to say the least. So uh, I don't like hearing these kinds of things when they come out of the World Economic Forum that there's going to be a cyber attack uh, because of their prescience, we'll put it, uh, their, 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 their prophetic uh, abilities. So it scares me when I hear that, and I think that's a real, a real concern. And I think another reason why to develop as quickly as possible, and we're, I think, way behind the, uh, the eight ball on this, uh, these parallel structures that could survive all this, mm -hmm. uh, surviving this possible disconnection from everything digital for a while, which would be banking, which would be all assets that are electronically held. Uh, so that could be a very serious... Yes, and one quick uh, follow-up to that. You mentioned something that was very on point the, about the difference between an ID and a digital identity. Yeah. And I think that is going to tie in with the coming cyber attack if it happens. Uh, the grid could be down for a number of weeks, possibly months, who knows. But when things come back online, what I've read in some of these uh, World Economic Forum type papers is that what they want to do to protect the internet and protect us from another cyber attack is they want everyone to have a digital identity that you would have to type in or, or, or it's not a regular password, but it would be some sort of di your personal, probably based on blockchain, your personal identity before logging into the internet. Mm -hmm. So you would not have access to the internet, internet unless you buy into their digital identity, which will be a global identity unique to your person. Dr. Rechtenwald, thank you so much for um, your comments. I'm wondering if you have a question for uh, Leo Holman from his remarks earlier today. Yes, absolutely, thank you. Um, I think that one of the only areas that we basically have a little friction mm -hmm. 
is your characterization and that is not communism mm -hmm. uh, or socialism. And I think what I use the term corporate socialism because uh, it is a corporate run socialism as I see it. There's this oligarchy on top and then actually existing socialism for everybody else. And they're using socialist ideology and rhetoric all over the place. So how, did, how would you reconcile that with this idea that we're dealing with fascism? Uh, I think we are dealing with economic fascism, but I don't use the term fascism per se because as you pointed out, it's international and fascism has a nationalist bent. So that's why I, I have eschewed mm -hmm, use of mm -hmm. that term. That's an interesting question and I'm glad you asked it. Uh, one of the reasons I like to use that term is because the left hates it. When you call them communists, it's almost like a badge of honor. I'm serious. You call them fascists and they flip out. Uh, the other reason is I do see, I think our, uh, what appears to be a, a little bit of difference of opinion there might more, be more semantical than anything else because when I look at the Third Reich and, and Nazi Germany, they could not have done what they did the destruction that they wrought, the killing of the Jewish population, the rounding up and putting them in camps, that was all done with the cooperation of major corporations. Mm -hmm. IBM was in there helping them. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, the big pharmaceutical company, I don't remember the name of it, but they, they were the ones, Bear. yes, Bayer, uh, helped with the, uh, the Cyclone D or B, whatever it was, that was the poison gas used in the, in the death camps. And so uh, it's this cooperation which you eloquently describe between the gov people in the government and the people in the corporation uh, to control and, and yeah. an frankly annihilate uh, any dissenters, to control the population. And one thing we didn't talk about, neither your presentation or mine, and it was kind of the elephant in the room, is this idea of they need a smaller population, a smaller global population. It is too unwieldy with seven and a half billion people to do what they want to do. Like you said at the end, it's not going to succeed and it will crash and burn as an economic system. But what if they're able to annihilate a third or half of the population? Does it then become maybe more tenable? Uh, you know, because they don't need a middle class as much as they do now if they have a much smaller, more manageable uh, population to fit into this new system they had, which you're calling it socialist. Corporate socialist. Corporate socialist. Yeah. I'm calling it uh, more similar to fascist, but what is in common, regardless of what you call it, mm -hmm. is it is collectivist. Yes. And, and we do have a historian coming up later in a presentation, uh, Bill Federer, and he'll go a little bit deeper into fascism, socialism, communism, and what it's been throughout the last 100 years. So we'll get into that. But I think you had mentioned that uh, there may be a goal or a reason to reduce the population significantly on the earth. That's, a, that's an incredible statement to say yeah. that. Do you want to say just a little bit more what your collective thoughts are? Well, yeah, that? Bill Gates in a 2010 TED Talk was uh, very frank about this. And he said that we need to go to a net zero carbon emissions, net zero. And the only way to do that, he said, uh, is we need to do a, he said if we do a, a really good job with uh, health care, uh, reproductive rights, and vaccines, then we can reduce the population by 10 to 15 percent. That's a quote from him. Okay, that's not my words. And, and yeah, and, and so, and he's repeated over and over that the only way to get to net zero is to have a smaller global population. It is interesting how verbal the people associated with the World Economic Forum are. Yeah. They, they haven't been shy. We're going to come back to this discussion with Leo Holman and Dr. Rechtenwald, and we'll be taking questions from our audience for them as well. But now we have United States Senator Rand Paul, who is online with us. We are highly honored to welcome Senator Rand Paul of Kentucky to Regent University, live from Washington, D.C., where he's been on the Senate floor voting. He will join us now to speak to us about his experience with medical tyranny. 
Dr. Rand Paul is a respected medical doctor. He was a vocal Don't. champion and remains so, fighting for our once protected civil liberties, and he continues to vigorously challenge rising medical authoritarianism. Would you please give a warm Regent University welcome to Senator Rand Paul. Thanks, Michelle, and uh, we miss you up here. You need to come and visit us more often. <laughs> but uh, absolutely, without question, we have never seen a period of time in our history where the government is so dominating the decisions that you make between you and your doctor. I have friends who are physicians who come up to me and they say they're being threatened. They're being threatened by their board credentialing. They're being threatened by licensure if they speak up. And what are they speaking up to say? Many of the same things that I've said. One, that uh, vaccines should be a choice. And that really, whether or not you get vaccinated or whether or not you choose to have treatment for COVID should be individualized. This is what Scott Atlas and the other doctors that advised Donald Trump said. They said, why don't we target the people who are most at risk? And why don't we emphasize them for encouraging vaccination and or treatment instead of saying one size fits all? I think it's actually malpractice to tell a 10-year-old that they should have the same response and same protective uh, decisions as an 80-year-old. So an 80-year-old is a thousand times more likely to die from COVID. It's sort of like someone goes into the, uh, into the emergency room. I'm 60 years old, 59 years old. I go into the emergency room and let's say I have chest pain. Would you treat me the same as an 18-year-old that shows up with chest pain? No, we both could be having a heart attack, but it's much more likely that I'm the one having a heart attack. And it's much more likely the 18 year old has anxiety or some other kind of problem that's causing that or asthma or, but typically not a heart attack. So we make different medical calls based on age. It's the same way with vaccination. So if you're under age 15, the death rate from COVID is one in 2.32 million. So you're more likely to die from a car accident. You're more likely to die from a meteor. You're more likely to die from being struck by lightning. And so I tell the people that are freaking out about kids and making them wear masks, which most of which don't work, but the people freaking out and saying this are not putting things in perspective. Because if we're gonna mandate vaccines for children for COVID, and we're gonna mandate masks for children for COVID, Really, we shouldn't have them all wear helmets with lightning rods because every time they go outside, they're at risk for being struck by lightning. And I think if we had helmets with lightning rods for all the children, of course, they'd have to be grounded and connected to the ground. So it'd be a little bit cumbersome to wear. But uh, I mean, that's the ridiculous nature of this. Nobody's really putting it in perspective. So if you ask me my opinion, above and beyond government mandates, should you get vaccinated? What well, depends on your age and your risk factors? particularly over 65 and probably over 55, there's a significant risk of dying from COVID. But when I say significant, it's still only about 1%. So it isn't like 50% of people are dying. When you, when you interview Democrats, they're like, oh, a third of the people are dying with COVID. No, it's a 99% survival rate in almost every age category, even in the age categories where there is a higher risk. But what we have learned is the government's not been honest with us. On the number one question that could save lives and could alter what you decide on whether or not you need to have treatment or whether or not you need to be vaccinated is, have you already been infected? So the CDC has consistently covered up what is the effect if you've been uh, infected already. Finally, about six months ago, Dr. Fauci was on CNN. And the first time I think of it, he's ever been asked a real question. They said, what about natural immunity? if you've already had the disease. And he said, oh, that's interesting. We should look into that. This is a year and a half into the pandemic and they haven't even bothered to examine natural immunity. Well, it turns out this, natural immunity is incredibly infective. If you measure a bunch of different groups, let's say we have unvaccinated people here and vaccinated people here. If you've been vaccinated and if you're in risk for being hospitalized and dying, generally older or overweight, you have 20 times less likely to be in the hospital if you've been vaccinated versus unvaccinated. But guess what? It also turns out if you've been infected, like myself, not vaccinated, that I'm 55 times less likely to be in the hospital than someone who's unvaccinated. Now, all of it points towards there being some benefit, 
from vaccination and from the infection. The two together are what provide for protection, and that's why we're doing better now. If you look at the statistics, if we take a thousand people from either your area, from Virginia Beach or from Virginia, we take a thousand people and we draw blood from them and say, do you have antibodies? Do you have immunity to either the virus or to the vaccine? Guess what? 95% of people across the United States now have immunity to either the vaccine or the disease. 60% of children under 18 have already had COVID. So why would we not factor that into our decision? The reason less people are getting sick is the disease has become less virulent, less lethal because of mutation. So we have a less lethal disease, but we also, it's no longer a novel virus. It's a virus that most of us know. 95% of us have either been presented with the vaccine or with the disease. So really we're in a great position right now and we should be back to normal. No one should be wearing masks and at risk for being taken down from YouTube, I'll say it again, cloth masks are ineffective, virtually completely ineffective. And the mandates have allowed people to wear them. So almost everybody in the country for the last year on planes, we're still doing it. We're playing the theater. I'm wearing a cloth mask on the plane. The only time I'm forced to do it, but it's of no value. It's, a, it's sort of this comfort or totem for people who believe in some sort of mass psychology to try to convince people, but it's not medically valid. But we do have a medical tyranny that's sort of affecting us. Dr. Fauci would be less harmful if he were practicing family practice in Peoria because only the people that were silly enough to choose him as a doctor would be hurt by his harmful opinions. Instead, he's the leader of the medical industrial complex the same way a central planner leads the economy in socialism. So everything that's bad about socialism is also bad about centralizing the authority and power in one person. Because if that person is wrong, it gets transmitted to everybody. And he's been wrong about so much, natural immunity. He's been wrong about masks. He's wrong about vaccinating young people. He also was wrong initially on whether or not steroids would work. I asked him the first time I met him, should we give steroids to those who are very sick? He says, oh, no, we've tried that. It doesn't work. Every patient in America today in the intensive care unit on a ventilator is getting high-dose IV steroids. The very first question I asked Dr. Fauci, and he got it wrong. But thousands of people died because he gave the advice not to use steroids. Thousands of people died also because he, he said we should vaccinate everyone the same. So a 25-year-old fit firefighter was at the front of the line competing with an 85-year-old. When my in-laws, we wanted to get them vaccinated, my wife called the public health department line in Bowling Green. She couldn't get a human because this is the government. So no one would answer the phone. But the first message on the machine when she got through to public health was, if you know anybody not wearing a mask, if you call this number, we'll send the police to get them. Really? So no help getting a vaccine, but they're willing to send the police. One other thing that we need to address, and a lot of people misunderstand, is that when Trump came out for hydroxychloroquine, he was for using a medicine in an off-label way. That's very common and has been done for decades. Hydroxychloroquine was developed for malaria. And then actually the most common use today is actually for rheumatoid arthritis. Why? Because it has anti-inflammatory properties for rheumatoid arthritis. Now, I'm not telling you to go out and buy hydroxychloroquine. I'm, I'm agnostic. I'm not positive. The studies, I think, are somewhat equivocal. But drugs like hydroxychloroquine, drugs like uh, ivermectin, and drugs like fluvoxamine, which is an antidepressant, have a secondary effect of having less inflammation. It should be your choice. Like I say, I'm not advocating you go out and do this. I'm saying it's your choice. Talk to your doctor. But the government should not be involved in your choices. This will go on. This is the beginning of the takeover, the complete takeover. Obamacare was a big part of government taking over. Now we're taking over, the, or the government is taking over individual decisions. So it's not going to end. Even if Biden stops the mask mandate on planes next month, which I hope he will, we've been pushing him to do so, it doesn't end. Right now, in some colleges, we're mandating three vaccines. And what do we know? The statistics show that if you're male between the ages of 16 and 24, they show that you actually are at increased risk for an inflammation of the heart if you take the vaccine. It's exactly the wrong thing. It's not even whether it'll benefit you, it will actually harm you. So as we go forward, I think it's important that you go ahead and understand that this fight doesn't end with COVID. COVID was the beginning of the government taking it over. What you have to do, what the young people of this country have to do is resist and push the adults not to take away your medical freedom. Thank you for having me. 
Senator Paul, thank you so much. We respect you so much. We understand you have to go back down to the Senate floor. We're sorry we couldn't have time for Q&A with you, but we appreciate you so much. Don't go away. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. At Regent University, we're providing world-class education today so you can achieve a brighter tomorrow. Your time is now. Let's change the world. Hi, and welcome back to Regent University. This is our forum on globalism rising. We just heard from Senator Rand Paul. Now we'll be hearing a Q&A with Leo Holman, investigative reporter, and Dr. Michael Rechtenwald, Chief of American Scholars. Our first questioner is at the microphone. Could you give your name, where you're from, and your question? My name is Sharon Sogut. I'm a master's of law student at Regent University. I'm from Norfolk. It is being said that President Trump's Operation Warp Speed is intended to speed up the globalist agenda so that it may force implementation before the New World Order's timeline, thus causing the globalists to fall into their own traps. Have you heard anything related to this? Yeah, I mean, Operation Warp Speed. Uh, yeah, I've heard a lot of complaints uh, from uh, otherwise Trump-friendly people, uh, patriot types, that think that the Operation Warp Speed was, uh, in fact, uh, Trump's biggest mistake, if not uh, in a colossal one, in effect, because uh, it expedited this rollout of a vaccine which really hadn't been tested long term for anything uh, and um, so and to the effect of of course making vaccine mandates come in, uh, come into effect and uh, so yeah that, that's I, I'm not going to comment on what I think about that uh, but that I've heard and read a bit of uh, a lot of complaints about it from thank you kindly for clarifying if I may address that quickly uh, yeah, I would agree that that was not President Trump's finest moment. Um, and if you noticed in his uh, Trump rallies, every time he would bring up the issue of Operation Warp Speed and the vaccines being super great, he would start to get booed. And this was the first time he was ever booed at one of his own rallies. And uh, lo and behold, after about three rallies of him being mentioning this Operation Warp Speed and how great it was and being booed, you suddenly see that dropped from his speech uh, at, the, at all of his rallies now. So, uh, and, and one other quick thing, he, yes, they did bring that vaccine on board quickly. However, if you look on YouTube and research a, uh, find a video of Dr. Tal Zaks, He's the chief medical officer of Moderna, and he oversaw the development of this vaccine. And he is on record in 2017 at a TED Talk stating that they already had this mRNA technology completely perfected. And that was in 2017. They were, this was a vaccine waiting for a virus, not a virus waiting for a vaccine. Yes, they had to tweak it a little bit to, to, you know, to get the coding for this virus, but the basic technology was already there. Thank you so much for your question. And we have an, our next questioner. And if anyone else is, has their question ready, go ahead and you can go up to the microphone. 
Gentlemen, thank you both for being here today. My name is Peter Mitchell from Regent University School of Law. You mentioned, Leo, in your talk how the churches have been co-opted. Could you speak a little bit about how the church can be woken up, if it can be? Many churches are promoting the vaccine. Many churches shut down without any complaint back in 2020. And related to that, what, if any, is the connection of the globalist elite to Satanism? Wow. <laughs> That's a big question there. Um, I personally have been very disappointed in the response of the churches in this whole entire two years that we've gone through. Uh, there has been some that have stood up. Uh, I think it was the Calvary Church in, in, in uh, California. MacArthur, John MacArthur stood against it, and there's been others. But I have frankly been completely disappointed in many of the big-name Christian leaders, and I won't mention them here because when I do, I tend to catch some blowback uh, that, uh, you know, they were not only, some were silent, and you could almost understand that, but then others were actively engaging in rolling out this vaccine, and I know for a fact that some of the big ministries were actually being paid to engage in partnerships with the pharmaceuticals to get this thing rolled out and to promote it in their churches. And I wouldn't say it's connected to Satanism, uh, but I would question the discernment of some of these Christian leaders because uh, I'm not even as high on this vaccine as uh, Dr. Rand Paul, what you heard there. I don't think anybody should have been, been uh, you know, offered to get it. Offered, yes, but there should have been zero coercion. I don't care what age you are, what age bracket you are, what your comorbidities are. If you get this vaccine, you are taking on a whole new set of risky uh, health outcomes. Uh, the myocarditis he mentioned, that's just one of them. In the first three months of this rollout, there was over 1,200 different side effects of the Pfizer, to the Pfizer vaccine that the FDA and the CDC uh, covered up and prevented the public from uh, learning about. They only recently released it after they got sued uh, and, and were forced to release it, and it came out in a huge data dump of 55,000 uh, pages, and people are still combing through that to find out what's all in there. Thank you. Uh, Michael Rechtenwald, did you yes, want to respond? Yes, I, I mean, also, the, there's, there's data that has come out of Great Britain that shows that the, the vaccine, vaccine is actually having a negative efficacy. It's actually worse than not being vaccinated in terms of getting sick and getting hospitalized and dying. This, this is data that's now emerged. Of course, they squelched it once it came out. Uh, but yeah, that's very, it's very much on the table. So um, yeah. You know, and it's interesting, too, how the statistics changed. Um, cases were being reported after a while to find out how many cases. They were starting with deaths. CNN, for instance, reported the number of deaths every day that would come from it. But you'd never get a data counter ever on CNN that reported adverse reactions yeah. to the vaccine. That number was scrubbed. That was considered disinformation. I think that's been a big part of what we've seen in the last two years. It almost seems like it's a deception and it's a delusion illusion that we've been dealing with. We have our next question. Your name and where you're from. Eric Phillips, originally from Seattle, Washington. I'm a 2L in Regent Law School. <laughs> and Older <your> student. <laughs> um, there's been some concern um, about the preservative, graphene oxide within, that was explained to me by a radiological interventionalist who kills cancer by moving the instruments in through the veins and then isolating them and killing them. What she said, what she told me, was that this has been a major contributor to the deaths caused by the vaccine, that this could be one of those issues that is, that is doing it and that it goes into the lungs and raise, lays resident in the lungs. And I looked back at the mercury that was done in the before as a preservative, and I'm one, you know, that, that has been linked to autism. Um, Jim Carrey's... Jim Carrey's uh, children, or one of his children, I think it was his son. So have you find, found anything about this graphene oxide and it being responsible for uh, any of the problems with COVID? Graphene oxide, and I'm told it actually turns into graphene hydroxide once it's in the body, is a toxic 
substance. Uh, I'm going to leave it at that because I'm not a doctor, but it is a toxic sust substance. Uh, and one of many ingredients in this vaccine that have never been released. Uh, you go to the pharmacy and ask for the package insert telling you what all is, what all, giving you a readout of all the ingredients in that injection, and they can't do it. Zero. In the box, it's zero is what she Exactly. And why is it? It doesn't exist. They do not tell you what the ingredients are in the box. She's pulled them out and looked at them, and that, that's what she told me. Correct. And why is this? Because it is not approved by the FDA, folks. It is only being administered under e what's called emergency use authorization. They tell you the Pfizer injection mm -hmm. is approved, that it was approved. That was a mirage. That was the Com Comirnaty uh, uh, injection, which is an affiliate of Pfizer. However, if you go and ask your doctor or the pharmacist to give you the approved Comirnaty injection, he won't be able to do it. This is an extremely important point. Yes, so it doesn't all the people exist. Who've been vaccinated in the United States today with this drug, it is not an approved injection. It is only emergency use. Uh, approval, not full licensure. And so because it's only uh, emergency use, they don't have to tell you what's in it. Uh, now, they are supposed to give you what's called informed consent. This is, this is the bedrock principle that came out of the Nuremberg Code, that any experimental medical treatment must be uh, accommodated with informed consent, meaning uh, you not only consent to it, but you're given all the information about it, okay? So you can make an educated decision as to whether you want to take this emergency experimental drug. They're violating our own laws, our emergency use authorization, federal law passed by Congress. They're violating that because it says you cannot be coerced, you must be given all the information, and it must be voluntarily accepted. How is it voluntarily accepted if you're told you'll be fired from your job if you don't get it? So they're violating not only the Nuremberg Code that came out of World War II, but our own federal law. Thank you, Leo. Dr. Rechtenberg, did you have any response uh, to No, that? I'd, I'd, I'd say that, you know, the, um, yeah, it's very clear that this is not the actual approved vaccine, and uh, it's, it's the emergency use authorization. We're basically still under that. Mm -hmm. And it, it is a violation of the Nuremberg Code to coerce anybody into any medical procedure that is experimental. Uh, so that, that, that is a clear violation. And this is a clear example of government authority authoritarianism yes. and yes. of corporate authoritarianism. Yes. Thank you so yes. much. Did well, it would seem, up? just to respond to that, it would seem that it, it could be disclaimed uh, in a legal sense is what we've been taught, that a lot of things can be disclaimed and, and written and put in there and still include the ingredients. Mm -hmm. it's, it's wholly un unreasonable. Uh, one last thing I wanted to say just quickly about the Moderna is that I knew of two men, they were over 80, and both turned the took the Moderna and both had, and these are isolated incidents, just separate incidents. I just want to say I came across them and haven't come across, asked anyone else though, but both of them ended up with strokes and just wanted to share that if you knew anything about the blood clotting that, that goes on with the Moderna or anything like that. Anyway, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much for your question. We have another question before this segment is over. Hello, I'm Doug Cook from Regent University. What role, if any, does the Russia-Ukraine war play in the Great Reset, or is there any overlap between uh, the parties that are involved in that conflict and some of the parties that you've been talking about in your presentations? Well, uh, as, as you may know, that Klaus Schwab basically threw Putin out of the World Economic Forum. Uh, he effectively banished him now since the... Uh, since the aggression. And uh, so <clears throat> uh, Putin has been very clear that he is not going to be party to any new world order. And that's part of his posture, I think. It has to do with the idea that he is defending national sovereignty 
and the sovereignty of his citizens. Now, I'm not saying that's what he's doing in invading Ukraine. I'm saying that that's the posture that he's had politically overall. And um, the invasion, I think, is, uh, w was uh, predicated upon a few things. First of all, of course, the coup in 2014, which was orchestrated under Obama and the Obama administration, uh, in which a democratically elected uh, president was replaced by a puppet. Uh, so this is uh, all very clear. And uh, so that puppet then had an aggressive posture towards Russia. And then, started to, then they started to uh, attack the, the uh, people in Donbass, uh, the Russian-speaking uh, people more affiliated with Russia than Ukraine. So there's a lot of history that, to this conflict that hasn't been aired through the mainstream media that is being squelched uh, in this kind of like cartoon version here that we have Zelensky as a, you know, a superhero and Putin as your super villain, and there's no gray area, and no, nobody has done it. You know, Zelensky's never done anything wrong in, in his whole life, and Putin has been nothing but a tyrant and dictator and a uh, murderer, mass murderer for all time. But uh, there's, there's some things to think about. Would the United States sanction having nuclear weapons owned by Russia poised on our southern border in Mexico? For example, would there not be a response to that? So this is something that, you know, Putin has been uh, very much uh, up in arms about and is up in arms about. I had is. wondered, Dr. Rechtenberg and also uh, Dr. Leo Holman, could you comment on the Young Global Leader Initiative that yeah. the World Economic yeah. Forum has? Yeah. Because Vladimir Putin was one of the right. students in the Young Le Leader group for Absolutely. World Economic Forum. We only have a little over two minutes yeah. left, but could you say something about this important forum? There's about 1,400 alumni, yeah. including uh, Prime Minister Trudeau, the, uh, oh. the Deputy uh, uh, Prime Minister, half of the cabinet in Canada, also much of the cabinet in Venezuela. Could you just speak Absolutely. about this Absolutely. Yeah, if you look at every Western country right now, not only NATO, but even, you know, over in Australia, New Zealand, you, then you've got the U.S., Canada, all the Western European leaders, you see nothing but puppets. It's like the World Economic Forum got rid of the last bastions of independent leaders. Uh, uh, when, when Trump was exited out and you had the leader in Italy, I forget his name, but he was another bastion of nationalist type leader. Um, yeah, and so every country now is, is led by basically a puppet of the World Economic Forum. Now, Putin, he was one of the early graduates of the World Economic Forum Young Global Leaders, Leaders Program, but as uh, the doctor said here, they had a falling out. I think Putin was offered uh, the terms, the terms of this great reset, and he said, no, I can't agree to that. And it was at that point that the whole Ukraine thing blew up. Uh, and this is what they're using as a fulcrum to get rid of Vladimir Putin because he does not ascribe to this great reset. Um, and, and that basically is, I think, what you're, going on, what you're seeing right now, total one-sided coverage from the media. Uh, every conflict has two sides. And I'm not saying Russia is in the right necessarily, but there is the Russian side to this story. And when people confront me and say, well, you're too easy, you're going too easy, I, put, I say one thing, Monroe Doctrine. Do you know what the Monroe Doctrine is? If you don't, go look it up, because that says the U.S. will not tolerate any hostile uh, force, any stacking of military arms, on it, not only on its border, but in this entire hemisphere. Western Hemisphere. We're, we've been stacking uh, uh, military hardware on Russia's border And with that, I think we've got to close. Our time is coming to an end. We have so many more questions, but audience, would you please help us thank our speakers, Leo Holman and Dr. Michael Rechtenwald.
University, we're providing world-class education today so you can achieve a brighter tomorrow. Your time is now. Let's change the world. I want to thank our studio audience. I also want to thank all of you watching online. For three hours, our speakers have explained to us the geopolitical situation in our world today. And now it is my pleasure to introduce to our audience Dr. Ed Heinsen. Ed Heinsen is a prolific author. He's a former dean of the Liberty University School of Divinity. And Dr. Heinsen will now explain to us what the Bible has to say about the times we live in. I've heard Dr. Heinsen speak on this topic before. He's not only an expert, he's an absolute joy to listen to. And I think you will love hearing from him too. Again, I urge you, contact other people that you know right now and tell them to tune in to hear the words of wisdom of Dr. Ed Heinsen. Welcome to Regent University, Dr. Ed Heinsen. Thank you, Michelle, and uh, thank you for allowing me to come to you by Zoom from across the state, uh, from over in Lynchburg. Uh, and uh, we're going to take a look at what the Bible says about the last days and what it says uh, in regard to uh, issues like globalism. You know, we're in a battle for the culture, that's obvious, and you all have done such a wonderful job of dealing with that today. Uh, we're in a wave of secularism uh, with the attitude that there really is no God, which leads to relativism, there is no truth. And if that's true, then selfism takes over, I'm all that matters. And uh, that leads to materialism. The more stuff I have, the happier I will be, won't I? And uh, that leads oddly to mysticism eventually. If God's not out there, who or what is? And uh, we're living in a time uh, where people are viewing the universe as a vast uh, place of random choice that really obliterates uh, the soul into a sense of meaninglessness uh, and God becomes nothing more than a moralistic therapeutic deism uh, of these last days. Now, in spite of all of that, uh, the scripture tells us there are some things that we should expect in the last days. And as we look at the day and age in which we live, we see that the stage is certainly being set in that direction. Now, I want to remind us in the beginning uh, that Jesus himself said, Nobody knows the day or the hour of my coming. People will read that text and say, aha, it says the day or the hour, but it doesn't say the year. Let's guess the year. But the point of the passage is nobody knows the time, so don't waste your time trying to guess the time. Be ready all the time because Jesus could come at any time. That we're to live in anticipation of his coming. So you live with an eye on the sky he could come at any moment, but you live with your feet on the earth, that you have a job to do to serve the Lord in the meantime to make a difference in the world in which we live. And when uh, he talked about signs of the future, he said, when these things begin to happen, I'll look up, know that your redemption draws nigh. So I want to suggest to us uh, several things that would indicate final signs of the last days uh, in which we're living. Uh, these things uh, in scripture are clearly indicated to us uh, and uh, we can take a clear look at them. 
If you'll give us just one second, we'll get this to advance forward and we'll do it. Daniel, we're stuck. Uh, what are we doing? There we go. So if you want to contact me, you can reach me at thekingiscoming.com uh, or over at libertyuniversity.edu. Final signs before the return of Christ uh, that are given in scripture. I'm going to suggest seven of them, and they all point toward these issues. Number one, uh, the rebirth of the state of Israel. You say, why is that so significant? Because Israel did not exist as a nation for over 1,900 years. Uh, the miracle of the rebirth of Israel uh, is something that God himself brought about. Uh, I have a book at home written by Joseph Seiss uh, in 1856. He was a Lutheran minister who in 1856 said, one day the people of Israel will go back to the promised land. I don't know how, but it will happen because the Bible predicts that it will happen. Whereas the vast majority of theologians were saying, that's never going to happen. Uh, Israel was destroyed by the Romans twice. Uh, Hadrian changed the name of the country to Palestina, which was Latin for Philistines. I wrote my first book on Philistine archeology span uh, over 40 years ago. Uh, that was about the worst name he could have given the country because he was trying to eliminate any memory of Israel uh, as a nation uh, and as a people. And yet the prophet Isaiah, uh, looking down through the corridor of time, uh, said, who has heard such a thing? Shall a nation be born at once? But as soon as Zion travailed, she gave birth to her children. Uh, that's in the last chapter of Isaiah 66, verse 8. Uh, the prophet Isaiah was living back in the six and seven hundreds BC, 700 years in advance. He foresees the nation being reborn in the land in the future. And we know that that occurred on May 14th, uh, 1948, uh, that suddenly with a declaration of independence, Israel was a nation again in fulfillment of that prophecy. Uh, and in spite of all of the challenges and difficulties uh, over these last 70-some years, God has blessed them. And today, half the Jewish people in all the world now live in Israel. That ought to get our attention. When there was only a handful of Jewish people there at the beginning of the 20th century, this may have seemed like uh, an impossibility. But today, it's more obvious than ever uh, God has reestablished his ancient people in their ancient homeland, and he's setting the stage for what's coming in the future. Now, that tells me that Israel will remain a major player on the international scene uh, in the days ahead. A second thing that I think is obvious uh, is rumors of war in the Middle East. If the Middle East were quiet and peaceful, we might wonder how would these prophecies of the end times ever really ultimately be fulfilled. But we all know that that's not the case. Uh, Islamic extremism uh, is pushing the limits uh, of uh, instability so often in many of the countries in the Middle East. Now, we're very thankful for the Abraham Accords for the nations uh, at Bahrain uh, and the Emirates uh, in Morocco that have made peace with Israel, uh, the peace that still exists between Israel and Jordan and uh, Egypt, et cetera. Uh, but uh, for the most part, uh, the Iranian hostility has continued to stir this up with Israel in the target zone of the end times. Uh, that if you've been to Israel and spend any amount of time there, you realize that they live out their daily lives realizing uh, that we are living uh, at the end of military hardware pointed at us uh, every single day of our lives. Uh, and the tensions uh, that still exist in the Middle East will one day 
uh, lead to conflict in Israel. The prophet Zechariah uh, put it this way. He said, it shall happen in that day. Now, when the prophets use the phrase that day, they mean that future day, not this day, their day, 500 BC. He's looking 2,500 years into the future, saying in that future day, uh, he will make Jerusalem a heavy stone for all peoples. Uh, even though all the nations of the earth are gathered against it, they will not be successful. And you have these predictions in the Bible that while God will bring the people of Israel back to the promised land, it will be in a time of tension, a time of threat, and ultimately a time of conflict. Now, Jesus himself said, uh, there will be wars and rumors of wars. The end is not yet. Uh, just because there's a crisis uh, somewhere in the world or in the Middle East or in Europe doesn't mean this is the end of the world. People ask me all the time, uh, Russia and Ukraine, is this the end of the world? No, it's not the end of the world. No, it's not the beginning of the tribulation period. The rapture has not yet occurred, etc. What we are told in the Bible is that in the last days, the final conflicts will come in the Middle East. The Battle of Gog and Magog, uh, described in Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39. The Battle of Armageddon, uh, described in the Bible. Uh, in fact, Armageddon only appears one time in the Bible. Revelation 16, verse 16. It's the only place you find that word. The battle itself is described in the 19th chapter of Revelation, when Jesus returns, speaks the word, and the battle is over. It's a battle in which there is no battle. He speaks the word, slays the army of the Antichrist, the beast and the false prophet are cast into the lake of fire, and uh, Satan is bound in the abyss. That has not yet happened. Neither of these wars have ever taken place. They're part of what the Bible predicts will happen in the last days. Now, in the meantime, I think as believers, we should pray for the peace of Jerusalem, work for the peace of Jerusalem, uh, and be thrilled when peace accords are made. Uh, the people that were involved in drafting uh, the Abraham Accords are actually going to be here uh, in Lynchburg later this week on Thursday. Uh, and uh, we will hold a series of meetings celebrating uh, what has been accomplished. But we do that also realizing this is not the end of the story, uh, that the scripture warns us that in the future, expect that a time of crisis will develop in the Middle East, uh, and the Western nations will have to get involved in some way to try to resolve this. When you look at the passage in the book of Ezekiel, the implication in that passage is the nations of Tarshish, that's Western Europe, will object to an invasion by nations that appear to be Russia and Iran uh, in the last days, but they will not intervene. Uh, that some of the Arab states will object, but will not intervene. Israel will be left on her own, having to trust the Lord to come to her rescue. Well, when I read that prophecy in the book of Ezekiel, one thing is very obvious. That particular battle, as it's described, has never taken place. That is yet to come in the future. And then the third sign that I think is obvious is the rise of the global economy. Uh, and you've talked about that extensively today. It's a reality. The clothes we're wearing were made all over the planet. Uh, you can say to yourself, I'm only going to buy American products but chances are half of the things in that product were made somewhere else. I grew up in Detroit, uh, the automobile uh, capital of America. You can buy an American car, but there are parts in it from Germany, Mexico, and other places, et cetera. But the global economy is a reality because of modern technology, communications, jet travel. It's a shrinking world in which we live. Uh, it only takes a matter of hours, and you can circle of the entire globe. 
Uh, my daughter's family was ministering in uh, Romania this past week. Well, they get on a plane uh, in Timisoara in Romania, and within a matter of a few hours, they're in Washington, D.C. Uh, the globe is right on our doorstep every single day of our lives. You say, well, why does that matter biblically and prophetically? Because the Bible says this in Revelation, the 13th chapter, talking about the false prophet and the Antichrist. And it says of the false prophet, he caused all, both small and great, rich and poor, to receive a mark in their right hand or on their forehead that no one might buy or sell except one who had one of three things, the mark, the name, or the number of the beast, etc. cetera. Uh, that ultimately the Antichrist figure, as he's described in the Bible, will gain control of a global economy. Well, there has to be a global economy in order for that to happen. And the global economy already exists. So these things are like flashing lights. You're driving down the highway here in the state of Virginia, uh, say between Lynchburg uh, and Virginia Beach, between Liberty uh, and Regent, uh, and there's a construction zone. And the flashing lights are going, warning you, slow down, something's coming up ahead, uh, et cetera. God has given us a series of flashing lights. Israel's back in the land in the last days. Uh, the Middle East is in turmoil in the last days, and the global economy already exists. Now, the economy is not evil in and of itself. The problem is that when someone can control the economy electronically so that nobody can buy or sell anything without this system being in place, that ought to get our attention. Now, the details, uh, it'll be obvious when the time comes. The word mark, for example, in the original Greek New Testament, karagma simply means a mark or a tattoo. Uh, it's some kind of a insignia, and uh, it involves a name and a number. Well, if you think of it, a credit card has an insignia, a name, and a number. Is there a way to take that information electronically, put it in your right hand or on your forehead so it can be read uh, electronically, instantaneously, we're already seeing that kind of technology develop today. It already exists. Therefore, the idea is this. Once that can be controlled internationally, you have a global economy that is vulnerable then to global markets and global activities. What happens in China affects what happens in Europe, what affects what happens in America. The globe circulates economically virtually every single day. You watch the stock market go up and down today in light of right now what's going on in Europe. And yet at the same time, we sense uh, that there are challenges uh, all over the planet uh, with China, with Russia, uh, challenges with North Korea, challenges with Iran uh, and Islamic extremism, et cetera. While the global system is in place electronically, it is not yet totally unified politically. Uh, I believe biblically that is yet to come in the future. But in the meantime, the global economy exists. Now, I've been in the ministry for 50 years. 50 years ago, that was not so obvious. People wondered how could this ever actually become a reality? But today, we know exactly how that is. Sign number four, the rush toward global government debt. Uh, in order to run the system economically, there has to be some sense of global control. And several of your speakers today have uh, dealt with that very, very effectively, reminding us that uh, the center of control uh, often is in Europe, uh, sometimes in America, sometimes in other places, 
But in reality, uh, what's happening uh, with NATO, what's happening uh, with the United Nations, uh, what's happening with the attempt to say all the nations of the world should follow certain policies, whether that has to do uh, with climate control, or whether that has to do with military control or economic control or economic boycotts, et cetera, we're seeing global governance affecting policy that affects the entire planet. Now, it's not yet fully perfected, but the push toward it is certainly there. It's certainly a reality. And unfortunately, it's virtually always been a reality. Now, from ancient times, there's always been this tendency to think if somebody or some system of people could control the world, then we could bring prosperity, stability, and peace. Instead, it brings instability, chaos, and ultimately war. Uh, the Bible says this, again, about the last days uh, in the book of Revelation. All the world marveled uh, and followed the beast. Now, the beast is a symbol used in Revelation for the Antichrist, who's empowered by the symbol of the dragon, Satan. And authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. Of uh, That, as the author of Revelation, I believe the Apostle John looks down through the corridor of time, uh, down into the distant future, he sees a time of international control by one person who is assisted by a false religious leader. A false religion and a false political leader try to gain control of the world. And eventually, if you read the book of Revelation in detail, it says the nations of the world gave their authority to the beast willingly. He didn't have to go out and conquer them all militarily, they give their authority to him in an attempt to control the world of the last day because the global system is being threatened and there's an attempt then to bring the whole thing together under one authority. And the authority is given to that antichrist figure. Now he's called a lot of things in the Bible. Uh, the Antichrist uh, is the abomination, he's the beast, he's the prince that shall come. Uh, the term Antichrist is only used in John's letters, First and Second John. In the book of Revelation, he's never called the Antichrist. He's always called the beast. And it's simply a symbol of the idea that while he may look like a prosperous leader, he's inspired by Satan himself. And I think... Uh, the passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 2 makes it clear that he will not come to power until after the restrainer is removed. So I'm not looking for the Antichrist. I'm looking for Jesus Christ uh, to come, uh, to call us home to heaven, to be with him before he declares war on the world. But in the meantime, uh, Satan has to sit back and wait for the sovereignty of God. Uh, Jesus said, Nobody knows the time of my coming, not even the angels of heaven. Uh, if the angels don't know, Satan doesn't know because Satan is a fallen angel. He's intelligent and brilliant. He can read the Bible and read the newspaper and make a guess. But again, been in the ministry for 50 years. I've heard every guess imaginable for the date of the coming of Christ. 1972, 75, 88, uh, 96, 2000, 2011, they're always wrong. Why? Because Jesus said, nobody knows the time. In fact, he even went so far as to say, nobody knows the time except my father. Now, obviously, Jesus knows the time if Jesus is divine, if he's God and has omniscience. But what did he mean? Only the Father can authorize the Son to go back and get the bride and bring the bride home to heaven. Uh, the whole promise that Jesus made to the disciples uh, on the night before he went to the cross, 
I'm about to go back to the Father's house. And if I go, I will come again and receive you unto myself. Well, he said that after Judas, the unbeliever, had left the room. The promise of his return was only for the believers. And seven times in that passage in John 14, he uses the pronoun you. I'm coming for you. I'm taking you home to the Father's house. And there are the palatial rooms, of the place of blessing, uh, etc. He's using the analogy of a Jewish wedding in the first century that I think the disciples would have clearly understood. The bride and the groom in those weddings were betrothed to one another in a permanent relationship. Then the groom would leave, go to his father's house, and add a room onto the house for he and the bride to live in. They were wealthy, maybe several rooms, or maybe even build his own house. The bride would remain at her house. In the meantime, the groom uh, would have to wait for his father to authorize his return by inspecting the room and saying, it's ready for the time of return. You can go now and get the bride. And then he would return by surprise, take the bride home to the father's house. Uh, I think that tells us uh, that we're to live in anticipation of the fact Jesus has gone back to the father's house. He's been there now for nearly 2,000 years, preparing a place for the bride of Christ, the real believers who will live with him in eternity forever and ever and ever in the father's house. In the meantime, we're to watch, we're to wait, and we're to be ready, and we're to keep serving. We're not just sitting here waiting to go. We have a job to do in the meantime to influence the world. The tension that we have as believers is prophetically, we know how it's all going to end. And so when we see trends moving in that direction, like global governance and a global economy, tension in the Middle East, uh, we understand the problems that will come with that and want to do everything we can to hold that back and ought to, uh, and hold back the spirit of antichrist that is at work in every generation but in the meantime uh, we also have to recognize ultimately these things will come to pass and the lord will call us home to be with him until he does we're to continue to work for the cause of christ spread the message of the gospel worldwide that jesus died for your sins he rose from the dead to give you the gift of eternal life, and Jesus alone can give you a home in heaven forever. Now, I didn't grow up in a Christian home. There was no God, no Jesus, no Bible, no church in our home. My parents were not raging atheists. They just didn't know any better. Uh, I came to know the Lord uh, through a church that preached the gospel, that built a new building a few blocks from our house, they sent out a flyer advertising daily vacation Bible school. Uh, you send kids there in the summer uh, when regular school was over with. My mother got the flyer and thought, great, I can get him out of the house for five days. Here's the flyer. Go down the street. Go to that church. Don't get hit by a car. You'll be all right. It was back in the days when kids were tough. My parents were tough, too. I went there, and I heard that Jesus loved me, that he died for my sins, that he rose from the dead, that he was coming again, that I could have a home in heaven forever, and it was free. I recognized a good deal. When the invitation was given, I raised my hand. Unfortunately, the lady that dealt with me, Mrs. Johnson, was very clear and very thorough. She let me know, kid, we're not talking about Santa Claus here. We're talking about the Son of God who stepped from the glory of heaven to the midnight of earth to pay for your sins. And when he died on the cross, he didn't die as a martyr or a victim, but he died as a substitute. He took your sin upon himself and then took the wrath of God against that sin and put it to death for you. And I'm calling on you to put your eternal faith and trust in what he did for you. I remember I said, yes, 
and meant it with all of my heart. God stepped into my life at that point. Later, my parents would come to faith, uh, but uh, none of us had any idea of what was coming in the future. Uh, that I'd one day teach over 100,000 students personally, uh, write 50 books, travel all over the world. I have an opportunity to preach in 40 different countries. Only God could do something like that. God is raising up people to make a difference in the world because eventually the beast will do everything he can to pervert that world, and Satan will do everything he can to take it away from God but he will not succeed. Sign number five, the revolt of apostasy. Apostasy is a simple Greek word, apostasia, which means to stand away from something, to make a declaration of truth, and then later turn around and say, I really don't believe that. We have a major problem today of people supposedly deconverting all the time. You know, I thought I believed the Bible, but I really don't believe it anymore, or I don't believe the basic truths of the Bible. I'm going to reinterpret it, reinvent it, reshape it, get it to say what I think I want it to say. Uh, and there have always been challenges to the faith, uh, and there's always been uh, tendencies, leakages toward apostasy, so to speak. But today, out of control more than ever before. The Apostle Paul wrote to Timothy in 1 Timothy 4 and said, Now the Spirit expressly says that in the last times, some will depart from the faith. Uh, expect this as you get closer to the end times. And then in 2 Thessalonians 2, he said that day uh, will not come unless the falling away, the apostasia, the departure from the faith, comes first, and then the man of sin, the lawless one, uh, is revealed. In other words, the Antichrist will not come to power until after there is a wave of apostasy and unbelief. Now, in the Christian world, there have always been differences of opinion from one denomination to another uh, as to how we understand church governance, or how we understand uh, the process of explaining the gospel ought to be done, or how the process of salvation takes place. But for the most part, uh, I, I, until about the middle of the 19th century, most Christians believed the Bible was the Word of God, Jesus was the Son of God, He died for our sins, He rose from the dead, and He was ultimately coming again, etc. Uh, those were the fundamentals of the faith, uh, the basic uh, truths of the evangelical movement. Uh, evangel is simply the Greek word for gospel. Uh, they believed the, the message of the gospel was true and needed to be proclaimed. By the end of the 19th century, apostasy was rampant in Europe. Uh, European theologians were saying, Jesus really is not the Son of God. A teacher, maybe a good teacher, maybe not a good teacher, but a human being. Uh, he was not born of a virgin. Uh, the virgin birth is a biological impossibility. Um, he didn't really die for your sins in the sense of atoning for your sins. He died the death of a martyr, of an example, and that's about all, etc. And they began to water down the basic truths of the Christian faith, and the end result was apostasy, lukewarm unbelief spreads through the European churches, and they become spiritually dead for the most part, and tragically still are. Now, there are some exceptions. I've preached in Germany and England and France and various places and seen God do some amazing things, but those are minority situations. The vast majority of people in Europe have no confidence at all in the truth of the Bible, or the power of the message of the gospel, the European church, for the most part, is dead. And the influence of it academically, then, spreads from Europe to England, from England to America. And by the beginning of the 20th century, 
theological liberalism and apostasy is spreading in the United States. The mainline denominations are walking away from the faith. Now, when the 20th century began, the liberal churches had most of the money, most of the buildings, most of the people, and most of the influence. But throughout the 20th century, within 100 years, that influence begins to dissipate because there's no commitment to the Bible, certainly no commitment to evangelism, and the influence of Christianity in American society begins to die. The only exception are fundamental evangelical Christians who say, no, the Bible is the word of God. It's the inspired word. The message of the gospel is true. Jesus really is the son of God. He died for our sins. He rose from the dead. And we need to proclaim this to the world. And because of that, they evangelize unbelievers. And the evangelical church grows and grows and grows throughout the 20th century. By the time you get to the end of the 20th century, the evangelicals have all the money, all the churches, and all the buildings, all the television programs, all the radio ministries, and they're influencing the nation. But as you get to the end of the 20th century, the wave of apostasy begins to erode even the conservative churches. And now, 22 years into the 21st century, there is a tendency in many of our evangelical churches to say, well, maybe we shouldn't take these things so seriously. You know, maybe Jesus isn't really fully divine, uh, but he has divine truths and ideas uh, that can be helpful to us, etc. cetera. Uh, maybe we should quit calling people to faith and just call them to a better life of some sort, uh, et cetera. Uh, and all of a sudden, we have people who once would have proclaimed the message of the gospel walking away from it today. That's the last bastion of conservative Christianity that's left. And as people walk away from that, they walk away from biblical commitments like their commitment to marriage uh, and family and morality, a uh, commitment to Israel, having a right to exist uh, in their own land, etc. And all of a sudden, the very groups that once defended these things are starting to water these things down and move away from them. That's one of those flashing lights that ought to get our attention. The wave of apostasy is already here. Uh, now, in 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 6, Paul said, you know what? What is neutral? Is restraining him, the Antichrist, that he may be revealed in our own time. And the one who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. So the restrainer is both a what and a he. I, I think there's only one person in all the universe powerful enough to restrain the Antichrist from being identified and revealed, and that's the Holy Spirit of God. Uh, that the Spirit of God restrains evil through the church through the message of the gospel, through the message of scripture, uh, and that that restraining ministry is still going on today until the time of the rapture, when the restrainer is removed, then and only then will Satan be free to empower someone to be the Antichrist. So again, uh, Satan has to wait until God makes his move first. Satan's limited by the sovereignty of God. And again, I'm not looking for the Antichrist. I've heard every crazy idea who it might be. It's usually some presidential candidate you didn't vote for. Uh, and you're convinced he's got to be the Antichrist. Uh, I, I, I've heard it all. Uh, it's John F. Kennedy. It's Gorbachev. He's got a birthmark on his forehead. Uh, it's Ronald Wilson Reagan. There are six letters in each of his three names. It's George Bush, and he doesn't know any better. Uh, it's Jimmy Carter. It's Bill Clinton, and Hillary's the false prophet. 
Uh, it's Obama. It's this person. I, I don't know anybody, though, who thinks it's Joe Biden. Uh, I haven't heard anybody say that uh, because the Antichrist is powerful, intelligent, uh, and uh, persuasive in every way. But our challenge is not to worry about who might be the Antichrist, but to look for anti-Christian systems that oppose the truth and push us further down the road of unbelief. Sign number six, I'd suggest, is the rage of evil in the last days. That evil will get out of control more and more and more. Paul said this to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3. But this know also, that in the last days, perilous times will come. For men shall be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, blasphemers, unholy, despisers of good, lovers of pleasure, rather than lovers of God. There's probably not a verse in all the Bible more descriptive of life in the Western world today than this verse. Selfism has taken over the lives of most people. That leads to an indulgence in entertainment, that leads to an indulgence in pleasure, in self-seeking, etc., and then leads to open blasphemy. Now, 30, 40, 50 years ago, there were plenty of unbelievers. They weren't blaspheming God as openly as they do today on television. One program after another after another uh, blasphemes the whole idea of the existence of God. Uh, you see this uh, in television programs uh, constantly, like uh, the Big Bang Theory, uh, where a group of young college graduates make fun of the idea of the existence of God because they're all bit of science. Now you have young Shelton, uh, who's raised by Bible-believing parents that he makes fun of constantly because he knows that everything they claim to believe is not true. And young people watch these programs and are influenced by that. There's an era of blasphemy running amok in our society. And those are just a couple of examples out of many examples. The rage of evil is out of control. And evil leads to violence then in so many cases where people's expressions of violence are out of control today as well. Uh, and then number seven, the reality of weapons of mass destruction. Now, people will say, Ed, the Bible doesn't predict nuclear war. Right, it doesn't technically because people would never have understood that in the ancient world. But the book of Revelation does predict things that sure sound like nuclear war. Uh, the first angel sounded his trumpet and hail and fire were thrown to the earth and a third of the trees were burned up and all of the green grass was burned up. You read that passage uh, of the trumpet judgments uh, in the book of Revelation uh, and all of a sudden, uh, the vegetation's burning up, the air is polluted, the fresh water's polluted, and the oceans are polluted. It certainly starts sounding like nuclear war. Now, we have dodged the nuclear apocalyptic bullet for the last 70 years, and I pray that we'll keep dodging it. But the very fact that Vladimir Putin threw that on the table recently, that ought to get our attention. That woke people up. You see, we're sitting on a bomb every day of our lives, but we don't like to think about that. We're trying to just enjoy life and move on. But the truth is, there are thousands of nuclear warheads on this planet. You can disarm two or 3,000. That doesn't solve the problem. How many is it going to take to blow up the whole planet one day? Probably a dozen would get the job done. Now, again, I think we should pray for peace, work for peace, do everything we can to de-escalate these crises, etc. But when I look at the biblical doctrine of human depravity, the sinfulness of the human heart, and the availability of weapons of mass destruction, 
time tells me it's only a matter of time until some madman somewhere has the bomb and is willing to push the button. You back somebody into a corner where he thinks this is my only option. And even though it's going to lead to mutually assured destruction, it could very easily happen. And the Bible, I think, predicts that ultimately it will happen. Uh, you and I are living in a moment of tension where we need to get the message of Christ to the world today as fast as we can because the clock is ticking, time is running out. Now, I'm not only a minister, I'm a professor. So let me give you the final exam. Ask yourself, is Israel back in the promised land today? I think the obvious answer is yes. Is the Middle East in crisis? Absolutely. Does the global economy already exist? Yes, it does. Is there a rush toward globalism and global governance? Yes, there is. Does apostasy threaten the church today? Yes, it does. Is evil out of control worse than ever before? Do weapons of mass destruction already exist? Unfortunately, they've already been invented. All of these things ought to tell us the clock is ticking, time is moving on, and we're on the verge of the coming of Christ. Therefore, we ought to live our lives to make a difference in the world in which we live now, share the gospel with as many people as possible that they might come to faith so that they would, as Jesus said, escape all these things that ultimately will come to pass. Now, we have just a couple of minutes left. And so if anybody has a question uh, you'd like to raise at this point uh, or a comment to make, uh, we'll be open to that. Uh, and uh, I'll turn this back over at this point to uh, Michelle or whoever is hosting at this moment uh, to see is there anything else anybody would like to ask at this point. Dr. Heinsen, thank you so much. That was a wonderful presentation, a brilliant presentation, and a hopeful presentation. We have our studio audience here right now, and I'm wondering, is there anyone who has a question for Dr. Heinsen? Yes, it looks we have, we have a gentleman going to the podium or to the microphone right now, and your name and where you're from. Dr. Heinsen, thank you for your talk today. I'm Peter Mitchell from Regent University School of Law. You talked about the, the church as the bride and going to the Father's house, a beautiful image that I was not familiar with. If, if the bride and the bridegroom resemble each other, what can you talk about the church following Christ in his passion and imitating him in his suffering? Um, because, the, you know, the church is called, we know in the book of Acts, when Christ appears to Saul on the road to Damascus, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he's, of course, persecuting the believers so that the believers share in the right. Lord's passion. Is, is that an aspect of theology that, that you are familiar with, and can you talk about that call of the church to follow the passion of Christ in the end yeah, times? Absolutely. I think that one sense, the passion of Christ to atone for our sin is unique to Jesus. We cannot atone for our sin like he does, uh, but at the same time, we're often called to suffer. Uh, we're called to serve, but we're also called... Uh, the difference, however, though, I think is... When you get to the book of Revelation, the wrath of God is being poured out on the world, and the church has often been of the wrath of Satan and the wrath of man, but the bride is not the object of the wrath of Christ. Jesus loved the bride, died for the bride, gave himself for the bride, uh, and he took the wrath of the Father against our sin, so that in the one sense, we suffer the wrath of humans and the wrath of satanic opposition, uh, and even the wrath of being made fun of on Saturday Night Live, if you will. But we don't suffer the wrath of God. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, 9 says, we're not appointed unto wrath, but to obtain salvation. So you have this beautiful balance in scripture. On the one hand, we're called to serve, and if necessary, 
to suffer. And Paul was told, you'll suffer many things for the cause of Christ. Peter was told that, and some of the other disciples, uh, etc. that if we're serious about our faith, in many cases, it's going to cost us human suffering. But the good news is we're not going to suffer the wrath of God because we are experiencing the grace of God and the love of God. Thank That's you. That's great news indeed. Thank you so much. Audience, can we please thank Dr. Ed Heinsen from Liberty University. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you so much, Dr. Heinsen. That was a wonderful presentation. Now we have about four minutes before we go to our next speaker, and I've invited the Hoff brothers, a little more casual than they were this morning, but I've invited the Hoff brothers to be with us and to share for the next four minutes maybe some thoughts that they might have about what they've learned today or something else that they wanted to share from this morning. Jim is in the white shirt, and Joe is in the darker shirt, so go ahead, Hoff brothers. Great. Thank you, uh, Dean Bachman. I want to call you Michelle all the time, but <laughs> you're a little more formal, Dean Bogman. You know, uh, we talked this morning or just a couple hours ago about uh, the, some of the posts that we put up, uh, 28,000 posts throughout uh, the past two years and all the changes that, uh, that we've seen, that we've written about. And uh, you know what was amazing with us looking back at some of these uh, reports that we put up was that a lot of the truth, it never changed. And yet we saw the totalitarianism, the authoritarianism, it, it just continued along the way. It was, it was even, um, you know, then we got to the, the mandates, the mask mandates, the vaccine mandates, and uh, they kept doubling, tripling down on the population, even though the facts were there from the very beginning, that this was just seniors. As Dr. Rand Paul just said, in, in his speech, it was just the seniors, it was the comorbidities, it was not the children, um, herd immunity was not addressed, uh, treatments were not addressed, as we, as we, were, as we spoke about. So it, it's really interesting, at, at least in our perspective, as we started looking through some of our old posts, that uh, it was, uh, the, the truth was there from the very beginning, but it was ignored. And these, these elitists, these globalists, these uh, people, you know, who were so hungry for power disregarded the truth and then had the audacity to tell us to follow the science, right? The science was there in front of our eyes from the very beginning. They were the ones, they're the ones who bastardized the truth. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, 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 wasn't, it, it wasn't anyone else, it was them. And uh, as, as Dr. Paul had said, Dr. Fauci was, was wrong from the, begin, from the beginning. That's exactly what we saw. And yet here is this man still in power. It's, 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 it's just really unbelievable where we are today. Mm -hmm. Joe. Yeah, and I think um, there's, there's, if you guys are feeling like I am, there's a lot, there's, there's a lot of fear. There's a lot of concerns uh, for, for maybe all of us, <laughs> a lot of us. Um, if we're not in that upper crust that's really behind this, this uh, world economic forum and that, then you're feeling lost, you're feeling probably out of control. And uh, Jim and I were talking also just recently, I went through, and Jim's been censored, by the way, by Twitter, by Facebook, by YouTube, and here's the, here's the blessing. He has been, by speaking the truth, the volume of his, his website's gone up from, uh, from you know, it's, it's, it's as high as it's ever been. Last year, there was over 900 million, 900 million hits. So if you keep sharing the truth, you will win. Um, I was attacked for sharing, and I, I mentioned this during the presentation earlier, that I looked at these numbers that uh, we were hearing from Ted Ross, the head of the WHO. He's saying 3.4% mor uh, mortality on COVID. I mean, that was absolutely frightening numbers if you really understood what that was saying. We're, we're going to, you know, three, uh, three out of four of us are going to, you know, three out of 100 of us are going to die even more. And, um, we, and looking at the numbers, we could tell that this was not right. Anyways, I was attacked for that. And it ended up being a, a situation where I ended up leaving Hong Kong after 20 years with the corporation and, and a successful career. I came back to the States and basically retired. And then at that point went full time with Jim. But the message that we're, we're hearing here is keep the faith. 
keep sharing the truth because it was a blessing because I left Hong Kong and one week later they changed the law there, China did, that if you say anything bad about China, we're going to ship you to China. And I know they did that to, some, some, to journalists. And I just missed that. And so God's in charge, and so don't ever forget that. Amen. Let's hear it for the Hoff brothers. Jim and Joe Hoff of the Gateway Pundit. Thank you so much. We will be right back with our next speaker. Don't go away. Regent University, we're providing world-class education today so you can achieve a brighter tomorrow. Your time is now. Let's change the world. That little talk, a stirring that says you are destined for more. Or sense of purpose you've always wanted to feel. That little talk, it's not for someone else. It's for you. Our final speaker today for our conference, joining us now from California, is Christian historian Bill Federer. He's a prolific author. He's a national speaker. And Bill is a great friend to Regent University, serving as one of our regents. And he's an easy, fascinating speaker to listen to. Bill Federer, like all of our speakers' messages today, can be viewed again and again, and you can share them with others. So go to regent.edu forward slash globalism to find all the speakers' messages from this conference today. And now, please help me welcome Mr. Bill Federer. Welcome. It's an honor to be a part of this special series on globalism rising authoritarianism, and the demise of civil liberties. I put together a book years ago called Socialism, the Real History from Plato to the Present. And the subtitle is How the Deep State Capitalizes on Crises to Consolidate Control. So people aren't in a hurry to give up their freedoms. But if they're in a crisis, they'll knee-jerk reaction, panic, and trade freedom for security. This natural response has been studied and put into effect intentionally to create or capitalize on crises for the purpose of getting people to surrender their freedoms on a local level and on a global level. Now, how to take power from the people. Uh, democracies and republics are efforts to take the power of the king and give it to the people. The most common form of government in world history is kings. They go by different names. Pharaohs, Caesars, Kaisers, Sultan, Tsars, Maharaja, Genghis Khan, Chairman, Mao's. The name changes, but it's the same. Power wants to concentrate into the hands of one person. Uh, democracies is where the people are in charge, but a pure democracy, every citizen has to be at every meeting every day to talk about every issue. Very time consuming and logistically, it could not grow larger than a city. Uh, republics are where the people are in charge, but they get to take care of their family and farm and have a representative in their place go to the city every day to talk politics. So republics, democracies we, is taking power of the king, giving it to the people. But what if the king wants the power back? Does he just go to the people and say, hi, I want to be the king. Give me control of your life. They're not in a hurry. So there's two methods to take power from the people. One is fear. When people get in fear, they will trade freedom for security. And the second is free stuff. The king's so nice, he's giving you free stuff. And then once you get dependent, he begins to set the hook like a fisherman. Uh, it's like a dick, uh, drug dealer takes over a neighborhood two ways. He can come in with guns and get people in fear, and they'll trade their freedom and pay the mob anything they want just to be left alive. But the other is the drug dealer so nice, he's giving away free drugs until people get hooked. And then he says, you want more free drugs? 
you're going to have to sell yourself into prostitution and rob from your neighbor. And so a, a hunter catches animals through gun and bait, right? One is the coming in the front door and the other is the back door. Uh, I was studying how to catch wild pigs. Uh, you put a post in the ground and throw some corn down. And then the next day, there's two posts and three posts. And the next day, you keep throwing corn down. The pigs ignore the posts and just eat the corn. And you put fencing in between until finally you got a semicircle and then just a little opening. And the pigs will squeeze through, eat the corn, and then you shut the gate and you caught yourself some wild pigs. It's dependency. It's the free stuff. Now, some scriptures, uh, Proverbs 29, 25, fear of man bringeth a snare. Snare is a trap. And free stuff, what's that? It says in James 1, but every man when he's tempted is drawn away by his own lust and enticed. So you have those two methods. So the deep state, uh, the those that want a globalist government, uh, create or capitalize on chaos and discord. And in the atmosphere of fear, they come along promising a solution of free stuff and get people into dependency and control. Uh, some scriptures, uh, Proverbs 133 says how good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. But Proverbs 6 says, six things the Lord hates, and the last is he that soweth discord. So we have unity, we have discord. When people get in discord, they get in fear. And that's when you usurp power. Imagine being in heaven and someone sows discord, right? Lucifer, and he's cast out. And then we have uh, Lucifer sowing discord in the garden with Adam blaming Eve and Cain killing Abel. And then we fast forward to the Hebrew Republic. This is that first 400-year period when Israel is out of Egypt. Gideon just defeats 100,000 Midianites. There is no threat to Israel from the outside. But Gideon has an illegitimate son named Abimelech, and he wants power. And so he goes to the town of Shechem, and he's the first one to, we have record of to do critical race theory, identity race politics to sow discord. Uh, it says that he goes to the men of Shechem and says, is it better for you that all the sons of Gideon reign over you? Remember also that I am your flesh, your bone and your flesh. So he's identifying with them on a fleshly level. And then um, it says the men spake of him in the ears of all the men of Shechem and their hearts inclined to follow Abimelech for they said he is our brother. So it doesn't matter if he can rule good or not. He's one of us. So it's an identity politics. And then they go to the city treasury and Abimelech takes money from the treasury to hire rioters. Antifa type people. And it says, and they gave him three score and 10 pieces of silver out of the house of Balbarith, wherewith Abimelech hired vain and worthless persons which followed him to commit violence. And they went into his father's house at Ophrah and slew his brethren. And out of this chaos, uh, the men of Shechem made Abimelech king. So this is the first recorded instance of a nation that's completely at peace, but somebody comes in and sows discord, uses money, hires rioters, does violence, and in the confusion, seizes power, makes himself king. Now, the Hebrew Republic would have ended here rather than a century later with King Saul had not someone throw through a millstone over the wall and it killed Abimelech. Let's fast forward. Italy, 500 years ago. So a bunch of city states, Venice, Genoa, Naples, Florence, Siena. They all have armies and fight. And Machiavelli thinks if one prince could control all of Italy, it would stop the infighting. So he writes a book called The Prince, where he advocates the ends justifies the means. The end of one prince controlling all of Italy is such a good end because it'll stop the infighting that any means necessary to get there is justified. Lie, cheat, steal. So if a prince conquers a city, the people would hate him. But if the prince pays rioters like Abimelech did to commit violence and set things on fire and kill cows, burn barns, the people of the city state are going to panic and want someone to come along and restore order. And uh, so the idea is that uh, the prince um, pays these criminals, they commit the violence, the people want someone to, to come along and fix it, and the prince comes in and gets rid of the very criminals he bribed to create the mess. Nobody will know the better for it, and everyone will praise the prince as a hero. So it's called Machiavellianism, where you create or capitalize on crises to consolidate control. Uh, this is the intentional creating of this crisis for political purpose. It's uh, referred to in politics as fear mongering. And it's actually a good marketing. You create the need and fill it. You go around the back of the house and set it on fire. And then you go around the front of the house and sell them a fire extinguisher. And they'll pay anything for it and even thank you for being there. So this Machiavellianism, you've more recently been made aware of this by a famous quote from Rahm Emanuel. Obama's chief of staff, where he said, you don't ever want a crisis to go to waste. It's an opportunity to do important things that you would otherwise avoid. And Hillary Clinton, I'm actually excited about this opportunity, this crisis. 
uh, the chief of staff for President Obama is an old friend of mine and my husband's, and he said, you know, never waste a good crisis. And that's what we're trying to do. Uh, Fox primetime Ben Dominich said the authoritarian left is using the permanent pandemic to achieve as many ends as they can imagine. This is Rahm Emanuel's famous dictum, never let a crisis go to waste. Normal times don't produce the outcomes that the authoritarian left wants because people are not scared enough to give them the limitless power they crave. Crises are necessary. And so if there aren't any on offer, they manufacture them. So you and I see a crisis, our response is how can we help people through it? They see a crisis, their response is how can we usurp power through it? Henry Louis Mencken wrote in uh, 1956, the urge to save humanity is almost always a false face for the urge to rule it. Ronald Reagan said, one of the traditional methods of imposing statism or socialism is medicine, it is a healthcare crisis. It's easy to disguise a medical program as a humanitarian project. This is a tactic called seizing the moral high ground or virtue signaling, where those that are wanting to seize power want to portray themselves as more caring than you. So casinos do this. If a casino wants to move into town, people don't want it. They cite statistics of crime going up. But if the casino can give some money to schools, they can seize the moral high ground and say, we care about the children. Are you giving money to the public schools? We care more about the children than you do. And unless you're out there campaigning for more casinos, you must hate the children. And so that's the strategy, Ronald Reagan said, with the healthcare crisis. Unless you surrender your body to the state, you must hate the children. You must hate the grant your grandma, right? And so forget the alternative protocols to treat different things. Uh, you just have to surrender to our agenda because we're more caring about people's health than you are. There's a Daily Caller editorial cartoon with two scientists looking through a microscope, and they say, it appears to be mutating into a totalitarian dictatorship. Reagan goes on, if you don't stop this, behind it will come other federal programs that will invade every area of freedom until one day we will awake and find we have socialism. Now, when he says, if you don't stop this, what he's saying is the response to usurpation is pushback. Every individual must say enough, no more. And the, the, the federal politicians, in many cases, have uh, let down the people, and the umbrella's been ripped, and now it's raining down on every person. And it's up to every female athlete to push back. It's up to every school mom to push back. It's ever up to every pastor. to. It's up to every single person on a local level to push back against the usurpation of power on an uh, American level, but also on a global level. Now, we're talking globalism. We're talking uh, globalism rising and the authoritarianism and the demise of civil liberties. Uh, let's look at a previous example in history, the British Empire. The British Empire became the largest empire on planet Earth, 13 million square miles, a half a billion people. How do you think they got there? Do you think they just walked into a country and said, hi, we want to be the biggest empire on the planet. Uh, give us control of your country. Mm, I don't think the people just said, okay, here. Well, let's look at how the British took over India. Uh, they landed in Bengal in 1714 and opened a trading post that turned into a trading fort that turned into them having guns and getting involved in local politics and observing the different categories, the different groups and the different kingdoms. And they would give guns to one kingdom, guns to another kingdom, and then stir up ancient animosities. So discord between the kingdoms. And when they broke out into fighting and bloodshed, then the British would come in to restore order and they would take control of both. And they did this again and again and again till they took over all of India, a quarter of the world's population. They tried doing this during the American Revolutionary War. And so British General Johnny Burgoyne lands in Canada, comes down, meets with the Mohawk Indians and promises them money for scalps. And they go out in front of the British Army and scalp Americans. It was so bad, it was listed as one of the reasons in the Declaration of Independence of why we were rebelling against the king. So the Declaration says, the king has excited domestic insurrections among us and has endeavored to bring on the inhabitants of our frontiers the merciless Indian savages whose known rule of warfare is an undistinguished destruction of all ages, sexes, and conditions. So the Indians knew on and off. When they're at peace, they're at peace. But when they're in war, it's unlimited. And they did this again during the War of 1812. The British controlled Pensacola, Florida. Just north was Fort Mims, Alabama. 
and the Red Stick Creek Indians. The French pronunciation of Red Stick is Baton Rouge. Bat Baton Rouge, Louisiana, right? Red Stick. Well, the British go to the Red Stick Indians and promise them money for scouts. They capture Fort Mims, Alabama. They capture 500 people, and then they proceed to scalp the, the people that they captured. The historical marker down there in Fort Mims, Alabama says here, Creek Indian War 1813-14 took place the most brutal massacre in American history. Indians took the fort with heavy loss, then killed all but some 36 of the some 550 in the fort. Creeks had been armed by British at Pensacola in this phase of the War of 1812. Do we really think the British Empire cared about the Red Stick Creek Indians? No, they were stirring them up for the intentional purpose of conquering both. Washington warned of this in his farewell address. He said, disorders and miseries, discord causes the fear, right? Disorders and miseries gradually incline the minds of men to seek security in the absolute power of an individual who turns this disposition to the purposes of his own elevation on the ruins of public liberty. Jealousies, false alarms, kindles the animosity of one part against another foments occasional riot and insurrection. It opens the door to foreign influence and corruption, which find a facilitated access to the government itself through the channels of party passion. What's he talking about? Well, back then it was the, the British and the French going to one party and saying, we'll help you against the other. But now it's the Chinese and the Russians going to some candidates and some parties saying, hey, we'll help you with money and we'll help you with this. And they're like, oh, really? You're so nice. You want to help us? No, they have a plan to take over the whole thing. And Washington is warning of this, that this party passion is going to open the door to this foreign influence. Washington goes on, let there be no change by usurpation. What's usurpation? That's the government taking away your freedoms that they're not authorized to do, but you let them get away with it because they're telling you that they're doing it for your own good. He says encroachment tends to consolidate the powers of all departments in one and to create a real despotism. Usurpation, though in one instance, may be the instrument of good, it is the customary weapon by which free governments are destroyed. This is his farewell address. This is his goodbye warning. He says, watch out in times of disorders and miseries, discord, chaos, crises, that you have some leader comes along saying, I, I have an instrument of good. I want to do something good. But he ends up consolidating power, and Washington says, this is the customary weapon by which free governments are destroyed, right? It's not during the wartime. It's, it's where you have leaders saying, hey, we're going to usurp and take away some of your freedom to solve this crisis. Washington goes on. Usurpation must always greatly overbalance in permanent evil any transient or temporary benefit which the youth, the youth can at any time yield. So let's look at Europe. We talked about uh, Lucifer sowing discord in heaven and then sowing discord with Adam blaming Eve and Cain killing Abel and sowing discord uh, in the Israel, Israel Republic that first 400 years, right, with Abimelech. We talked about Machiavelli sowing discord. And, uh, but now let's look at Germany after Napoleon and the Napoleonic Wars killed 6 million people. Uh, the King of Prussia wants to strengthen the state and he has a philosopher named Hegel, who teaches at the University of Berlin. Hegel influenced Charles Darwin, and Hegel influenced Karl Marx. Karl Marx was a member of the Young Hegelians at the university, a radical student group. And so how do you concentrate power? Well, Hegel's idea was called dialectics. It's a triangle. One corner is a thesis. The opposite corner is an antithesis or antithesis. And the top corner is a synthesis. It sounds complicated, but it's not. So Karl Marx says, okay, the, the thesis is the status quo. It's the starting point. Everybody's used to the way things have been, and they sort of got accustomed to it. He says, you have to create the antithesis. You have to create a problem that's real bad, so bad that people panic in fear, and they're willing to trade their freedom for security to some leader that proposes an answer that's just half as bad. And then that becomes the new starting point, and they create another problem that's real bad, and everyone panics in fear, gives up some more of their freedom to settle for an answer that's just half as bad. And then they create another problem that's real bad, and people surrender more of their freedom to settle for an answer that's just half as bad. And every time they settle, they're giving up more of their individual freedom to the state. 
right? So power is concentrating into the hands of the state, crisis after crisis, and the promised solution after the promised solution. So Karl Marx, he says, how do you create an antithesis? How do you create a problem that's real bad? Well, you have to send in agitators, agent provocateurs, community organizers, labor organizers. Their job is to find people with grievances, stir them up to riot and sow discord, very similar to Abimelech sowing discord, very similar to uh, Machiavelli uh, and this prince paying criminals to uh, cause problems in these city-states, very similar to the British going into India or to the American Indians and stirring them up. And so this idea, Karl Marx, with the German mind that likes to organize things, says you send in these agitators, they create a domestic crisis, and then everyone panics in fear and is willing to surrender their freedoms for security. And so Karl Marx called this critical theory. It's where you categorize all the groups in a country, economically, religiously, ethnically, and you call some victims, others oppressors, haves and have nots, and you pit them against each other until it breaks out into bloodshed and panic and fear, discord, and everybody is knee-jerk reaction, wants to surrender their freedoms to somebody who promises to fix it, and that's when they let go. That's what Washington says, that that's the customary weapon by which free governments are destroyed. Originally, it was called critical economic theory, and they would organize the proletariat against the bourgeoisie. Right? They'd organize the working class against the business owners, the poor against the rich. And then it was critical racial theory with organizing blacks against whites or critical religious theory, right? C organizing Catholics against the Protestants or Muslims against the Christians. They even or took advantage of what was the Congo, right? Organized the Hutus against the Tutsis. So the Belgian and German colonizers went into the Congo and would measure different features about the different peoples. And they would say, you're a Hutu and you're a Tutsi. They created artificial distinctions that had not been there before. And then they stirred up animosities between them. And it broke out into fighting and warfare and bloodshed and even genociding each other. And then the colonizing power would come in to restore order, very similar to what the British did in India or tried to do with the American Indians in America. And so could you imagine the government breaking people into groups and pitting them against each other and to take advantage of the controversies between them? Uh, Castro said the revolution needs the enemy. The revolutionary needs his antithesis, which is the counter-revolutionary. And if enemies were lacking, they had to be fabricated, Richard Pipes wrote in Communism History. So you can't get people to give up their freedoms unless there's a crisis, right? You, you have to have the antithesis there, and you have to have an enemy to organize against that people feel enough afraid of that they're willing to give up their freedoms. And if there aren't any, you manufacture them. Like a, like a white supremacist or a nationalist or some group that doesn't really exist, but you want to create a phantom enemy so that you can get people into fear so they'll give up their freedoms. Jesus talked about this. Mark 3, 24, he says, if a kingdom be divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. So you have to get the kingdom to divide against itself. It's sort of like introducing an autoimmune disease into the body politic. What's an autoimmune disease? It's where your own body attacks your own body on the inside. Your immune system begins to attack your own organs. And so this is what's done to the body politic. You want to uh, call it, they call it critical race theory, where patriotism is the enemy. And so you want to get people to identify with subgroups and then pit the subgroups against each other to divide from the inside. Franklin Roosevelt said, whoever seeks to set nas one nationality against another seeks to degrade all nationalities. Whoever seeks to set one race against another seeks to enslave all races. The so-called racial voting blocks are the creation of designing politicians who profess to be able to deliver them on election day. FDR says again, remember the Nazi technique, pit race against race, religion against religion, prejudice against prejudice, divide and conquer. Charles Barkley, NBA player on CBS Sports Panel, April 3rd, 2021, said, man, I think most white people and black people are great people. I really believe that in my heart. 
But I think our system is set up where our politicians, whether they're Republicans or Democrats, are designed to make us not like each other. So they can keep their grasp of money and power. They divide and conquer. He goes on, we're so stupid believing our politicians, their only job is, hey, let's make the whites and the blacks not like each other. Let's make rich people and poor people not like each other. Let's scramble the middle class. I truly believe that in my heart. Even Malcolm X in 1963 said the white liberal differs from the white conservative. Both want power. But the white liberal has perfected the art of posing as the Negro's friend and benefactor to use the Negro as a pawn or a weapon in this political football game. And the white liberal controls the ball. Now, how did this begin to come to America? Right? Karl Marx writes the Communist Manifesto, 1848. But in 1894, you have Chicago and the Pullman Railroad Car Company. And they had an economic downturn and could not pay the workers what they did before. And so the workers had grievances. And somebody came in to organize these workers with grievances. His name was Eugene Debs, a certain candidate for president, uh, had his picture on his wall of his office, Eugene Debs. He organizes these workers with grievances to protest and to riot and to commit violence. And the rioters destroyed $80 million worth of railroad cars spreading to 27 states. And since everything in the country is shipped on railroad, the entire nation is paralyzed. Could you imagine somebody organizing, rioting, and burning, spreading from city to city, paralyzing the country? Well, Eugene Debs then started the Socialist Party of America, and he ran for president five times between 1900 and 1920, one time from prison. And then in 1920, branching off is the Communist Party USA, and they run candidates for president every year from 1920 to 1940. What happened in 1940? Democrat President Franklin Roosevelt makes a treaty with Stalin during World War II. And the Democrat the Communist Party USA says, why should we run our own candidate when here the Democrat candidate is making treaties with Stalin? So from that point on, they just simply began to back Democrat candidates and infiltrate that party. And it's documented. Even Ronald Reagan said, I didn't leave the Democratic Party. The party left me. Zell Miller, the last pro-life Democrat senator, I had the privilege of meeting him years ago. He said, unfortunately, the National Democratic Party has been taken over by the very liberal left-wing leaning special interest groups in Washington. So these are credible people making documented statements that their party was infiltrated and taken over. But lest we think they only want one party, there's Congressman Albert Herlong, 1963, reads into the congressional record the 45 goals and tactics the communists have laid out to take over America. And one of them was capture one or both of the political parties. And it's fairly easy to do with money because right? it takes lots of money to run for office. And once uh, the money is given, there is a feeling of obligation to vote the way the well, those that contribute to you. And, uh, and then he goes on Resist any attempt to outlaw the Communist Party. Another tactic was do away with loyalty oaths or pledges of allegiance. So we talked about uh, Lucifer sowing discord in heaven, Satan's, and then he gets named Satan, and he goes into the garden, sows discord, Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel, sows discord with um, Abimelech there in the Hebrew Republic. Machiavelli talked about sowing discord to seize power. We talked about the British sowing discord in India and, and, and in America. We talked about the Congo, the sowing of discord. And, and now we're moving up a little closer to the present. We had Eugene Debs taking advantage of the discord to organize. And let's go over to Germany. In the 1920s, Germany was a republic. The people were in charge, ruling through representatives. Someone starts a party called the National Socialist Workers Party. And the head of it was Hitler. And this party had a violent under the table arm to it. Um, they were like um, an Antifa, you know, sometimes uh, committing violence group, and they were called brown shirts. They were nicknamed Sturmabteilung, which means stormtroopers, because they would storm into the meetings of Hitler's opponents and disrupt the meeting and shout down the speakers. 
And then the brown shirts would lock arms and block access to public buildings. Could you imagine people locking arms and blocking things in public? And then they blocked off streets. And then they went into the cities and they smashed windows and looted and set on fire over 7,500 stores owned by Jews in the night of broken glass. Could you imagine people doing this type of thing? And oh, did I mention uh, they had an attack on their capital and the burning of the Reichstag. And evidence points to Hitler's own people setting the fire. But in the confusion, in this, uh, the insurrection of the capital being attacked, Hitler blames his political opponents and has them arrested and detained and then shot without a trial. And when the dust settled, Hitler didn't have any political opponents left. The crises that was created by his people allowed him to usurp power. So we see this strategy uh, also used in the Soviet Union. 1934, Stalin is facing a growing anti-Stalinist movement. And at the same time, Stalin has a friend, Sergei Kirov, the party boss of Leningrad, who's giving speeches praising Stalin, and he's becoming very popular. They even built a statue to Sergei Kirov. Well, Stalin had an idea. He would assassinate his friend, Sergei Kirov. Nobody would suspect that he did it, but it would eliminate a potential rival. And he would blame the assassination on the anti-Stalinists. And everybody would believe that they did it because they didn't like Stalin and they didn't like Sergei. Stalin used this crisis as an excuse to arrest, to detain, to investigate, and to kill over a million people in the first great purge of 1936 to 38. Matter of fact, Erdogan did the same thing in Turkey. He had political opponents. He goes up in an airplane, flies in a circle, and he lands and he claims there was a coup against him. And he just happens to have a list of 30,000 of his political opponents that he pulls out. They get arrested, they get zip tied, they get taken away, and they've not been seen since. So this strategy is pretty well documented and so then when we had an insurrection in Washington, D.C., uh, even Tucker Carlson showed this footage of the very first people coming into the U.S. Capitol. I want you to pay attention to the first group of assailants as they break into the building. The second man through the window is wearing full tactical body armor and is carrying a baseball bat. And we... Now, excuse me. <clears throat> now, if we look at this, the group of men dressed in black, there were no group of men like that at the Trump rally. And they sort of don't look like they were your common Trump supporters that got stirred up by a speech and decided that they were going to break into the Capitol. And they just happened to have tactical gear uh, on their backs. This looked like it was very similar to what happened with Erdogan, with, with Stalin, and with Hitler, and these other different instances. And uh, we begin to see that there were FBI operatives in the crowd. And then we noticed that the U.S. Capitol building has 2,300 police officers. It's the most protected building on planet Earth. And it has big metal bulletproof doors that can only be opened by the inside because of these very powerful magnets at the top. Somebody had to buzz them in. And then we have video footage of a guy named Ray Epps who was in the crowd the night before saying, we got to break into the Capitol. We got to break into the Capitol. And the people around him are saying, fed, fed, fed. They knew that this was a uh, federal agent operative in their crowds trying to stir them up. And there's other articles that lean to this being an entrapment, something that was planned from the inside. And um, there was uh, a New York Times journalist, and he, on a hidden video, reportedly captured. Uh, it says that what happened on January 6th was overblown, fake drama, fake news, full of FBI informants. Now, in psychology, there's something called psychological projection, uh, where the attacker blames the victim. Little kids do this. I didn't start the fight, you did. It's called blame shifting. 
or Karl Marx says, accuse others of what you do. And this has been found uh, and described as blame shifting or George Orwell's double speak. But David Axelrod was the campaign manager for a previous president. And he said on NPR radio, April 19th, 2010, he said in Chicago, there was a old tradition of throwing a brick through your own campaign office window and then calling your press conference to say you've been attacked. So you do the crime and you blame it on your innocent opponent and they get maligned and the story gets legs and they got to back up and go on the defensive. And most people only read the headlines and they considered guilt by association. And this is an effective strategy. Uh, matter of fact, if there's a candidate that's uh, running for president and maybe colluding with Russia, giving away a fifth of the U.S. uranium to Russia in exchange for $145 million contribution to her foundation, she wants to pay for a steel dossier to accuse her opponent of colluding with Russia. And his name gets smeared with it in the media. And if it ever gets pointed back at her, by that time, the water's muddied. The public doesn't know who to trust, and she gets a pass. Let's say there's another candidate that's extorting Ukraine, saying, stop investigating my son, or I'm going to hold back billions of U.S. aid. You want to accuse your opponent of extorting Ukraine. You accuse them of the exact crime that you're guilty of. Their name gets smeared with it. If it ever gets pointed back at you, by that time, the water's muddied, and the public doesn't know who to trust, and you get a pass. And the investigation process is nothing more than an opportunity to subpoena all the evidence that can convict the guilty person and destroy it. Laptops, hard drives, text messages, servers, emails. Well, let's look at this strategy after World War II. So we talked about the sowing of discord in heaven, Lucifer, the sowing of discord in the garden with the Bimelech, with Machiavelli, with the British Empire, with the brown shirts uh, and with Stalin. But now let's look at after World War II, Germany, France, England give up their colonies. And so there are new nations coming into, into being with brand new leaders. And it looks hopeful, except the Soviet Union decides to do critical theory. They send in their agents into the countries to identify all the groups and categorize them. Ethnically, Bosnians, Croats, Serbs. Religiously, Sunni, Shia, Orthodox. Racially, economically, it doesn't matter. They would call some victims and others oppressors, some haves and some have-nots, and then they would stir them up against each other till they would protest and have riots and bloodshed it and violence. Why bloodshed? Because once people get in fear, they no longer think logically, they think emotionally, and they can be more easily manipulated. The term is fear-mongering or race-baiting. And then they would co-opt the media with bribes and threats to blame the new leader of the new country for all of the problems. And when the country gets panicky enough in fear, they would do a coup or a rigged election and replace the leader with a Soviet puppet. And country after country fell, and Latvia, Estonia, Lithuania, Yugoslavia, Hungary, and all these countries that are falling are called behind the Iron Curtain. And Mao Zedong tweaks it in China, and instead of doing the uh, Hegelian dialectics with a thesis, antithesis, synthesis to do a couple crises and seize power, Mao Zedong said, you call it a continuous revolution theory. You continually have crisis even after you seized power. So they'd, ha they'd have a crisis and take the land from the rich people. And another crisis, take the land from the middle class people. Another crisis, take the land from the poor people until finally the government had all the land. And this continuous revolution theory has been integrated. And so it's almost like a continuous pandemic that you wanna to continue to keep the fear going so that you can get the people to give up some more and some more of their freedoms. Now, Truman, when all these countries are falling to the Soviets, he does nothing. He thinks the United Nations that he helped form will bring world peace. But the next president is Eisenhower. And he gives a speech in 1963. He says, the United Nations has seemed to be two distinct things to the two worlds divided by the Iron Curtain. To the free world, it seems it should be a constructive forum. 
To the communist world, it has been a sounding board for their propaganda, a weapon to be exploited in spreading disunity and confusion. Discord. We're back to that. So Eisenhower's choices. He can do nothing and let these countries continue to fall, or he can do something. And that's what he decides to do. So um, the U.S. Secretary of State Dean Acheson and CIA Director Alan Dulles had begun to get involved in this type of activity. In 1952, they allowed participation in a covert plan uh, to join with some of those in Egypt's military for Project FF to remove Egypt's King Farouk and replace him with Gamal Nasser. Well, now we have Eisenhower and a more serious incident with Iran. Iran in 1953 had a leader named Mazadek. And he began to side with the Soviet Union, and he nationalizes the oil industry in Iran. And you say, big deal. Well, wait a second. Britain has no oil fields. So in 1908, Britain formed the Anglo-Iranian Oil Company. You know it better as BP. All right? So in 1954 is when they changed the name from Anglo-Iranian Oil Company to British Petroleum. So once Iran seizes all of these BP assets, Britain is having an oil shortage. And so they appeal to Eisenhower for help. And Eisenhower approves the first CIA operation to overthrow a country's leader. It's called Operation Ajax. And the CIA operative on the ground is Kermit Roosevelt Jr., the grandson of Teddy Roosevelt. He's an expert in foreign languages. He goes to Tehran and he organizes mobsters and gangsters and radical imams, and they stage protests and riots and attack mosques, and they co-opt the media with bribes and threats to blame Mazdek for all the problems, and they nurture weak links in the military. And when the country gets panicky enough, they do a coup, and they put Mazdek under house arrest, lock him away for the rest of his life where he dies, and they replaced him with the Shah, who loved America because we put him in, and he did have a claim to the throne. And, and the CIA did the same thing in uh, Guatemala, 1954, and the same thing in the Congo, Dominican Republic, Brazil, Chile. And the KGB did the same thing with Brezhnev and Khrushchev helping Yasser Arafat to start the PLO for one purpose, sow division in the Middle East, and helped Castro to sow division and take over Cuba. And Brezhnev and Khrushchev helped Che Guevara to start FARC in Colombia and ELN in Bolivia for the purpose of identifying groups, pitting them against each other, creating crisis and taking advantage of that to seize power. Uh, there were hundreds of these coups and coup attempts in Africa. And this period of time is called the Cold War. And these tactics of going into a country, observing all the groups, and then pitting the groups against each other till it breaks out in violence. Everybody gets in fear. They want someone to come along and quickly restore order, and power gets usurped, uh, and the freedoms are taken away. And so back to the title of this series, that gl uh, globalism rising, authoritarianism, and the demise of the civil liberties, that there has to be a crisis before people will want to give up their civil liberties. If you just ask them, hey, uh, uh, please give me all, all your civil liberties, They'll, they wouldn't do that. So you have to have some motivation to have them give them up. Now, the Cold War, uh, there was a debate amongst candidates of a certain party, and the to topic of socialism came up. And Chris Matthews on MSNBC uh, said, I remember the Cold War. I've seen what socialism is like, and I don't like it, okay? It's not only not free, it doesn't work. I believe if Castro and the Reds had won, there would have been executions in Central Park. So this was the last time that Chris Matthews was on TV. Evidently, something he said uh, went the wrong way. Uh, and, but what's he talking about executions in Central Park? Well, Castro had an executioner named Che Guevara. And Che Guevara wrote, we executed many people by firing squad without knowing if they were fully guilty. I'd like to confess, I discovered I really like killing. Blind hate against the enemy creates a forceful impulse that cracks the boundaries of natural human limitations, transforming the soldier into an effective, selective, cold killing machine. A people without hate cannot triumph. So you want to get one group to hate the other group. 
So you go in the thesis, antithesis, synthesis, you want to create a problem, you want to create an enemy, and then you want to stir up this emotion of hate. And then in the confusion, you seize power. Coming a little closer to home, we have Saul Alinsky. He rode around with Al Capone's hitman, Frank Nitti, in Chicago. And he observed that all they had to do was kill a few people, smash a few windows, and the whole neighborhood would panic in fear and submit to the mob and be willing to pay him protection money just to be left alive. And so Saul Linsky says, let's apply this to politics. And Hillary Clinton did her senior thesis on Wellesley College. And uh, we see that Saul Alinsky writes, the first step in community organization is community disorganization. Disruption of the present organization is the first step. The organizer's first job is to create the issues or the problems. The organizer must first rub raw the resentments of the people of the community. An organizer must stir up dissatisfaction and discontent, fan the latent hostilities of many of the people to the point of overt expression. The organizer polarizes the issue, helps lead his forces into conflict. He must search out controversy, for unless there is controversy, the people are not concerned enough to act. This is the politics that we have been experiencing for the last generation, the intentional wanting to get rid of patriotism, get people to identify with subgroups and pit the subgroups against each other and even teach this, this in the schools. Instead of being united and patriotic in the schools, you want to teach division. You want to get people to identify with subgroups for the purpose of pitting them against each other as victims and oppressors until it breaks out in rioting and social disruption so that everybody gets into fear and then the government can seize more of your freedoms. This is done on a national level, but also on a global level. You need to have global crises that are so terrible that people globally will give up their freedoms. Now, Saul Linsky has an acknowledgement in the front of his book, Rules for Radicals, to Lucifer. We started off talking about Lucifer sowing division and discord. Well, here is, it says, lest we forget at least an over-the-shoulder acknowledgement to the first radical known to man who rebelled against the establishment and did it so effectively, he at least won his own kingdom, Lucifer. So how do you destroy a marriage? You sow discord. How do you des destroy a family? Sow discord. How do you destroy a church? Sow discord. How do you destroy a business? Right, sow discord. How do you destroy a country? Sow discord. How do you take over globally? You need discord. You need a crisis. You need big global crises. So we look at the different crises. We had Occupy Wall Street and Charlotte riots and Milwaukee riots and Baltimore riots and Mizzou protests and Ferguson riots and San Bernardino killings. And it's almost like some of these things have an air of having been planned with pallets of bricks being dropped off right where they're about to have a peaceful protest. I spoke in Emporia, Kansas. A former state rep had the city uh, uh, meeting auditorium, and we had a meeting, and uh, they told me, yeah, they were going to have a peaceful protest in their town, and somebody had dropped off a pallet of bricks right where they were going to start their protest, and there was no construction in the area. And the local people put enough pressure on them to stop the peaceful protest. But there were reports of pallets of bricks being dropped off in Dallas and in cities all across the, the, the country. I mean, where's the NSA? Aren't they supposed to be monitoring everything to find out where all this, these people that are wanting to do terror are? And some areas, the people won't riot. And so there is a importing of people from other countries that have a propensity to rioting. Let's look at the COVID response. The first thing was to let criminals out of jail. I mean, really, you, you couldn't think of anything else to do with them? Well, you let criminals out, guess what? Crime goes up. And then there's fear in the city. And some people feel unsafe in the city and they move out. Who? Maybe those with families. Okay, pro-family people, they usually belong to one particular political party. Uh, who's left in the city? Well, more people dependent on entitlements. Well, they tend to belong to a different political party. And then COVID response was close businesses down and stand by while they're looted and vandalized. And the, the police are ordered to stand down and the police are defunded. So now pro-business people move out of the big cities. 
Well, they tend to belong to that first political party. And then churches are shut down where pro-life people gather and organize. And um, then uh, schools are closed and students that have been indoctrinated with hate America are free to riot. Who would want to get students to riot? Well, Albert Herlong, 1963, reading these communist goals and tactics into the congressional record, said one of them is get control of the schools. Use them as transmission belts for socialism and communist propaganda. Get control of teachers' associations. Put the party line in textbooks. Use student riots to foment public protests. Even as far back as 1963, they were talking about this. So the net COVID response was more people of one political party move out of the big cities, leaving the other party with monopoly control of city politics. And in election years, whoever wins the big city wins the state. Whoever wins the state gets all the electoral votes for the state, and the president is elected by electoral votes. So it's a domino effect. You have violence go up, you shut down businesses and churches, people of that particular party, for the most part, move out and leaving the other one with monopoly control. If someone wanted to do voter fraud, there would be fewer people of the other party to observe. Matter of fact, they only needed six cities to win the last election. Milwaukee, Philadelphia, Phoenix, Atlanta, Las Vegas, Detroit. They win those six cities. They win that state and they get all the electoral votes for the state. So uh, you see a net benefit to one particular political party in the COVID response. So we talked about fear as one of the tools to get people to give up their freedoms so it's concentrated back into the government and ultimately back into the hands of a dictator. Uh, let's talk for a moment on the second method, free stuff. How do you get people to give up their rights and freedoms or civil liberties through free stuff? It's called the Great Reset. And Karl Marx, Frederick Engels wrote the Communist Manifesto. And then they wrote this, that they are alchemists of the revolution. Their business consists in spurring it into artificial crises. And every new crisis must be more serious and more universal than the last. Every fresh slump must ruin more small capitalists. This will increase the number of the unemployed. And in the end, commercial crisis will lead to a social revolution. I mean, who would want to put out of business the small capitalists? Well, socialism is a two-tiered society of a ruling class, a deep state, and the ruled class, all the everybody else. You, there's no room for a middle class because they can pool their money and challenge the ruling class. And so Lenin is credited with a statement, grind the middle class, the bourgeoisie, out of existence between the two millstones of taxation and inflation. Taxation is you just take away their money and then you funnel it to pay your supporters, right? Like Abimelech did. You take the city treasury money and you use it to buy rioters. Uh, one is so taxation, but the other is inflation. And if you inflate the currency, everybody's savings disappears. And then you have people that can't survive and they throw themselves at the feet of the government and say, help. Sort of like in Egypt, when there was a famine and the people didn't have food and the government says, we'll give you food, but it's an exchange for your cattle, your land, your children, your lives, right? So 1934, Chicago Tribune has an editorial cartoon of a guy looking like Trotsky riding on a board, plan of action for US, spend, spend, spend under the guise of recovery, bust the government, blame the capitalists for the failure, junk the constitution and declare a dictatorship. On the side, it says it worked in Russia. Spend, 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 what's that? That's having infrastructure and uh, stimulus bills for creating trillions and trillions of dollars and they're not intended to stimulate and they're not intended to build the infrastructure. They're intended to create trillions of dollars chasing the same amount of goods, causing those goods to inflate in price. So much so that people on fixed income can't survive. And they go to the government and they say, help. And the government says, we'll give you help. Here's a check. And then they incrementally say, for you to continue to get these checks, you have to get the latest booster. You have to file online so we can get the metrics of your face. Uh, and we, we matched your name and address up with the gun registry records. We found out you have guns. You have to give those up if you want to continue to get the check. And, and one by one, they're going to have requirements. 
And this is where the gl big global reset sets in. Now we saw a little of this during the Great Depression in America and FDR comes along and he says, I have got big government solutions, but it's gonna take away a lot of your freedoms. He has 3000 executive orders and mandates. One of them is he outlawed the private ownership of gold. People were burying gold coins in coffee cans in their backyards to get away from the president's mandate. Well, FDR had someone that continued his legacy named LBJ. And the New Deal programs are now called the Great Society Welfare State. And it's getting as many people on welfare as possible, and then you control their lives. And this comes from two socialist professors at Columbia University, Richard Cloward, Francis Piven. And they said, well, you can institute communism with tanks and guns, or you can get everybody to be dependent on the government, but you first have to inflate the currency. You first have to create a financial situation where people cannot survive. So they willingly come and sign up for handouts from the government. And then you got their vote forever. It's effective. And um, anyway, so now we look at uh, a global picture. Now, we see in Russia that um, uh, Putin's invading Ukraine. And uh, we see that uh, Putin has his own reasons for invading and terrible things are happening. Violence and killings, it's horrible. He needs to be stopped. This needs to be stopped right away. But if you were to see it from a bigger picture, uh, this is... But this scenario has been created by Biden. So the U.S. was oil independent and we were finishing the Keystone Pipeline and America was exporting oil and Biden immediately cancels the Keystone Pipeline and puts on lots of anti-business regulations on that industry and then begins to buy oil from Russia to the tune of billions of dollars a day from Russia. And then we see that um, uh, Putin goes into Ukraine. And now we have the whole world uniting against Putin. And him being isolated financially with sanctions. And if the scenario is that Oil is the number one commodity sold worldwide. It has always been sold in US dollars. And Russia is the third largest supplier of oil in the world. And if Russia is cut off from the financial Western uh, avenues of trading in dollars, he may be pushed into a corner to have to sell his oil in a ruble yuan transaction to China without using the US dollar. And other countries, even Saudi Arabia, indicated that they might begin to sell their oil in something other than the U.S. dollar. If this happens, the U.S. dollar will lose its status as the world reserve currency. And there will be trillions of dollars that have already been created that will no, nobody will want. And they'll come back and inflation will go through the roof and the dollars will lose its value. So much so that people will not be able to survive. If it takes $1,000 to fill up your, your gas tank, who's got $1,000 of bills handy? And so there is the uh, possibility of the government coming to the rescue with a digital dollar, with a Fed coin. Uh, President Biden did sign legislation recently that would allow for a digital dollar. As a matter of fact, over 100 countries have implemented and developed a digital uh, ability to do transactions. And what would happen if there's lots of zeros added on with inflation, but if you can still use your phone and tap it, if you can still uh, continue your transaction, it doesn't matter how many zeros are after it, as long as you can keep doing your business, and it'll look like the government has come to the rescue. But then when you realize that now it's like a, a Bitcoin style transaction, but it is run through the government, they can track everybody. They not only can track everybody, they can turn someone off if they don't like them. Like a little lady in Canada that 
donated $50 to their freedom caravan and her bank account, bank account got turned off. And then they can add to this electronic currency where it can't be spent to, in certain businesses and in certain charities and certain places, it can only be, it's programmed currency that can only be spent in certain other areas. There will be control. And then added to the credit score is ESG. It's a environmental and a social wokeness and a governance. It's, it's the a, a government saying, we're not only gonna look at your credit worthiness of paying your bills, we're gonna look at how woke you are. China has already implemented this and they'll begin to integrate all of your purchases, all of your website searches, all the, your geo positioning on your phone and they can see who you're in the vicinity of. And if you're around somebody with low credit scores, your credit score goes down. And, and this is again, what China is using so that people aren't even able to buy uh, train tickets to get to work or get promotions or get loans for things unless they have a high credit score and a high social credit score or an ESG score. Again, this is all the taking away of civil liberties in a time of panic, in a time of crisis, that people normally would never have given up the control over their life in a normal setting. But now with a in international crisis and having someone to blame it on who is a bad person, who's doing bad things, but this is a bigger picture of taking advantage of that crisis for the consolidation of control. And um, one of the interesting things when you look at politics is foreign aid. And it is more and more coming out that whenever the government calls for billions and trillions of dollars to be sent around the world for global warming or for um, helping with different things, more often than not, the money goes to third world countries and goes to corrupt leaders in these third world countries who get to keep a portion of it and then funnel the rest of it back to the corrupt politicians in the United States. And it's sort of interesting when Hillary Clinton was secretary of state, the U S government was giving lots and lots of money to Ukraine. And guess what? Ukraine citizens in the Ukraine, according to the wall street journal report funneled $10 million back to the Hillary Clinton's foundation. Ukraine was the number, it's the poorest country in Europe, and it's funneling the most money to the Clinton Foundation. Isn't that interesting? That the US taxpayer money is going to Ukraine and then it finds its way back into this particular politician's foundation. Well, this topic is very important. It is not all the answers, but it is a historical observation of the tactic of when people get in fear, they will give up their freedoms. And so there has been a well-developed timeline of the intentional creating or capitalizing on a crisis to use it to consolidate power and also to get people into dependency and then you can control them. And it goes from a local level to a national level to a global level. Uh, in a spiritual view, uh, which I have to encourage myself uh, spiritually, uh, is that it's also in times of crisis that people turn to Christ. So the same crisis that's going to cause power to concentrate, um, it's going to cause a lot of people to turn to Christ in their crisis, in their distress. And then lastly, it's in times of crises that God raises up leaders. What are the favorite stories you like in the Bible? It's when God's people are in a crisis situation and he raises up little nobodies with faith and courage who, who stand up and resist and trust the Lord. 80-year-old you know, Moses against Pharaoh, the most powerful military force in the world, or a teenager David against the most feared Goliath thug, or Gideon against 100,000 Midianites, and he gets 30,000 Israelites, and God says, tell everyone that's scared to go home. He gets down to 10,000. God says, still too many. Go drink from a creek and wills it to 300. And then God rolls up his sleeves and says, watch this. In other words, the God that we serve wants to make the odds look even worse. So I'm convinced 
I'm not a theologian, but I'm convinced that possibly the same crisis that's going to cause some people to panic and fear and surrender their lives to the Antichrist and take the mark of the beast, that same crisis is going to cause other people to rise up in faith and courage, like the early church. And they're going to pray for more boldness in the time of crises and say, God, use me in this crisis to love the unlovable, to defend the defenseless, to reach out to those in need. And this is our turn. This is your turn and my turn. And the good Lord decided for us to be alive right now. And he knows all the backroom deals that everybody, all the corrupt people are doing. And he said that you've got enough to handle it. He's chosen for you to be alive right now. This is your turn to be the Gideon and the David and the Moses and the Deborah. Well, thank you for taking time to view this. God bless you. Thank you so much for that message, Bill. It was wonderful. We appreciate it. Mr. Federer also recorded for our benefit a second powerful message also on this same topic. It's part two. So while we don't have time right now to broadcast this second part of his message, you can watch it in its entirety. It's at Regent dot edu forward slash globalism where you're watching this program right now you can go to regent.edu forward slash globalism the same site you're watching now to see part two of his message we are very grateful to bill for all of his work so please give a round of applause to bill federer And now I want to thank you, our wonderful studio audience who is here today for being a part of our conference. I want to thank those of you online who are with us today watching for being a part of this conference. Won't you please send others to regent.edu forward slash globalism where they can watch a replay of today's conference in its entirety and where they can forward to others each individual message. You don't have to send all five hours. You can forward each individual message from each of our great speakers. So let's thank Jim and Joe Hoft from the gatewaypundit.com for their presentation today. Would you help me thank Mr. Leo Hoffman from leohoffman.com today. And would you please thank Dr. Michael Rechtenwald from the American Scholars. We owe a, a great deal of thanks to Senator Rand Paul of Kentucky. Also to Ed Heinsen, who brought us his great message from Liberty University. And of course, Mr. Bill Federer. <laughs> I want to thank the great media team here at Regent University. There's no one like them. My wonderful assistant, Anita Reed, for all of her help in today's program. And everyone at Regent University who made this event possible today. To our studio audience and our online audience, we thank you for your participation today. We urge you to share today's important messages with those who need to know more. And finally, we must thank Cheryl McCleskey. Because of her generosity, Cheryl McCleskey sponsored today's conference and she made this event possible. I want to thank you personally, Cheryl. Again, thank you for joining us today. And now, would you please join me in a final prayer as we close out our conference? Father, I thank you for our speakers. I thank you that our times are in your hands. We don't despise the, the darkness. Instead, we're here to light a candle as we trust in your care and your provision. So I thank you, Lord, that you are God and we are not. In your mighty name I pray, amen. currency of leadership is sacrifice. People who care enough about the nobility of their objectives to give all that they have in order to see those objectives come true.
My goal with Regent is to see it not rival Harvard and Yale, but to rival Oxford and the Sorbonne in the Middle Ages as, as a school that can impact the whole society. If we really want to change the world, we have to understand what the world really is so that we can effectively reach those people. In the time that I've been at Regent, I could just feel the Lord calling me to serve Him and to serve His people. You can tell the professors, the administrators, everyone that they're willing to pour into your life. There is so much opportunity for you to become a success that will make history tomorrow. It wasn't just me. It wasn't just my story. That God was doing the same thing throughout the world. If we are a dedicated and committed people, Making the world a better place to be is what it's all about.